welcome everyone to our open session recognitions. We've been in closed session since 4 p.m. Dr. McClay will now start our recognition portion of our evening. There we go, how's that? All right, this is an exciting annual event for us where we honor our district-wide employees of the year. There are six different categories, um, and these folks represent the amazing employees that we have throughout the district doing a variety of jobs. Many of them then turn in applications to the county, and then every once in a while, we are super, super honored to get a county award winner as well. So without further ado, our assistant superintendents and the supervisors of each of these employees is gonna get up and share a little bit about the individual employees. And we're gonna start this evening with Dr. Valdez introducing, I believe it's our principal of the year, which will come first. I'll keep my day job. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Lisa Brown. She is our principal of the year. I'm very excited to talk a little bit about her, that she is homegrown, and I love that about her, and she's a graduate from Temecula Valley uh, School District. Uh, she started with our district in 2005 as an employee, as a classroom teacher, and she's always stood out as an instructional leader. Um, she took a principal position at Lavornia um, in 2016, and she is focused on the whole child with guiding and supporting positive behavior intervention support, or PBIS, on her campus and holding weekly meetings to address the social and emotional needs of her students. She's been a successful principal and a collaborative elementary um, team member of the principals within the district. She's involved in all aspects of her campus and successfully guided uh, Lavornia as they transitioned to a Title I status. And throughout the pandemic, Lisa has brought her leadership team together and enabled other staff, students, campus training and support to thrive during this year. As a mother of two elementary school students, Lisa has had a balanced perspective of leading Lavornia's families in this online world. And because of her incredible attention to detail, her management skills, her instructional leadership, she has led our students and staff through a very difficult year with a heart and a care for all. I'll just make a side statement that um, I actually taught with Susan Lavornia, and in many ways, when I was at Red Hawk as a teacher, she was a student, kind of dates myself, but I wanna tell you that she very much has the heart of Susan Lavornia as well. So it's so nice to see that she is leading that staff. So it's a true honor tonight to recognize Lisa Brown, our Principal of the Year. I'm not sure, Lisa, if you want to introduce anybody or say anything, you can. You don't have to, though. And then we want you to step over at some point to Mrs. Brosh and you'll get your picture taken. Um, I'm here with my husband, who, thank goodness for him during this pandemic, because <laughs> um, he helps with the kids and everything else at home. But I'm just really humbled for this award, um, especially this year when so many, every administrator stepped up to the plate and went above and beyond the call of duty. So just thank you so much. Oh, next up, I would like to ask David Schlotman to come and join me, please. David Schlotman's um, a, a passion for people and dedication for learning have contributed to a thriving English uh, learner community. Through David's guidance, the, English, um, the District English Language Advisory Committee, or better known as DLAC, 
parent participation has grown tremendously this year they had one meeting with over one hundred forty parents in attendance david works with jenny romero to provide what they call coffee see fess for parents to continue to come in for informal coffees to continue informing our english learner community of all the changes that have occurred during the pandemic uh, he has worked with the team to support all students driving to houses to ensure students have access to learning helping students without wi-fi to get connected um, manning uh, the learn english learner hubs at both crown hill and temecula valley high school david is known to drive out to some of our remote remote areas and he sets up a table and the students come out of their homes and and uh, apartments and they come to him and they get help with their devices I kind of call him the Pied Piper for English learners but it's just incredible it's informal but it's just made a tremendous difference he's worked uh, tirelessly with sites to ensure instruction and compliance um, is monitored and David and his team support designated and integrated instruction all, on all campuses and his vast educational experience his bilingualism his personality have led to tremendous support of our English learner families so whether in DLAC, a cafecita, a home visit, or with staff, he is always present in the moment to show each person how much he cares and is dedicated to supporting our families and our students. So it's indeed a pleasure tonight to recognize David Schlotman. Well, I do have something a little I'd like to say, but I, I really am also humbled by this award and uh, it's an honor. I do appreciate it. And it, it's, an, it's an award that I really feel that I need to share with our whole um, EL team because there's nothing I've been doing that they haven't been aware of and supporting and, and thinking up and, and making it happen. So uh, here's to those guys as well. They've done an awesome job. And, and, you know, it has been a difficult year for everybody. And think if you don't speak English, you, know, you can't get those, or you don't get those district emails right because you don't have internet or your internet doesn't work or whatever you don't read the you don't read english so it's really been uh, a hard year but i think that you can be confident that your el team here at the district and seriously as you just heard across all the sites have really stepped up to the plate i mean uh, just the, the fact that we started to get these hubs and kids coming in to school kids that will live way out in wine country where there's no internet for anybody apparently uh, it's just uh, amazing that that all happened. That was a district endeavor. Um, I, I know you just heard about DLAC. Uh, we've had our, one of our board members be there. Mr. Schwartz, thank you for, for being there. Uh, and you should know that we've, we've also been bringing in a huge contingent of uh, Chinese speaking families. Uh, if you don't know who Jean Weinfurter is, she's our, our Mandarin translator. And between her and our DLAC co-president, Annie Xiang, who also is Mandarin speaker, we, We've really reached out to a whole new group of people, and it's been, it's been really exciting. And you also heard about the internet coming to different families. Uh, we've got 15 families that are you know, in, the, in the queue to get internet way out in wine country. I just checked this afternoon. We've got seven families that are connected. I've called them. They're ecstatic. It, it seems to work, fingers crossed, that it, that it keeps on the way it is. In addition to all the porch visits and all the rest of it, there's been lots of there's been lots of work done on behalf of, of our English learners. I just really want to shout out to, I, I have to say, it, I know I, I uh, where is Dr. Valdez, but she's always the person who says, go for it when we come up with these ideas. Thank you. Uh, you know, equity, access, and inclusion. And you have kids that don't have internet, they don't speak English, bring them in. Thank you. No, seriously. Um, I, I really want to also say thank you for the leadership and the, and the the support and the guidance of Mrs. Deus. I know she's here, there she is. And Anna Tapley, I know she's watching online, hey Anna. But seriously, these guys have vision too. I don't know how they see around corners, but they do. And I really, really appreciate our whole team uh, is blessed by that. And lastly, I just wanna say to my two uh, local group EL team leaders, Sean O'Brien and Jenny Romero, wherever you are watching, you guys rock. Where are you? You rock. It's seriously, the, the heart and soul of, of these folks is amazing to what they do to reach out for our children. And if a society is known by how it deals with its most vulnerable uh, members of that society, a school district is also known by how we work with them. And you know what? 
there is work to do, but there's, it's going very well. And I think you can be proud of what the, uh, the leadership team and the EL department has done. We are giving it all we've got. We've got. I'm super happy to be a part of it, and I really thank you for this award. I share it with our team. Thank you. We also want to recognize Mrs. Schlotman as well for coming tonight. <laughs> All right, next I would like to call up Aaron Nelson, please. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll hold this for tonight then. Okay, then Mr. Arce, would you come forward to honor our Classified Administrator of the Year? Good evening, everyone. Our certificate uh, classified <laughs> administrator of the year. How are you doing? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Is Mr. Joe Mueller, uh, Director of Human Resources Development. Joe Mueller has done an amazing job in our human resources department. As a former principal for our district, he's considered someone who's highly respected and trusted by all the staff. One of our principals uh, said the following about Mr. Joe Mueller. When I think of the district staff members who have most impacted my work in difficult times, Joe Mueller rises to the top. Joe Mueller has literally served as a lifeline for me when I had had some of the most difficult conversations with staff over the last five years. Joe loves TVUSD and he serves site leaders in a manner that makes them feel special and supported. I'm also happy to share some of my personal observations of Mr. Mueller. This past year, Joe stepped up to the challenges and has gone above and beyond to support the needs of our department. In addition, in this COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Mueller has been instrumental in providing our staff with important information to support their understanding of the various different processes and protocols in place. He's passionate about his work and his constantly researching things such as legislative updates, new guidelines, and other relevant topics. On a personal note, in this short time we've worked together, Joe has been a great resource for me. He has a beautiful family. I'm blessed to work with Joe, and I consider him a really cool work buddy. <laughs> members of the board and members of the community, I proudly present to you Mr. Joe Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Arce. Um, I am truly honored to be recognized in this capacity, especially um, during this pandemic. It is, uh, it's been a challenge for our employees and um, it's been an honor to support our employees. Um, I have to give thanks to our amazing uh, support staff in human resources. Um, they truly are experts in what they do. Um, I've been supported by executive cabinet along the way. Um, so thank you to all of you, Dr. McClay. Um, and we've met a lot with our associations this last year. Um, and so I'd like to give an, a special thanks to the leadership of both CSEA and TVEA, and in particular, the negotiation teams. Um, I think we counted like 60 sessions with, uh, combined. And so we spent a lot of time together. So, um, it was, uh, it's been great to lean into the relationships that we established pre pandemic to make it, um, through some difficult times together. Um, also would like to recognize Mr. Arce, what a great addition to our team. So uh, thank you. And um, I would like to recognize my beautiful wife, Jody. So, thank you. Thank you. And Mrs. Velez will now come up to introduce our Site Support Employee of the Year. Thank you. 
So I would like to invite up Amanda Chapman. And I so just want to give you a hug, but I know I can't. But um, So I'd like to introduce you to Amanda Chapman. Amanda Chapman is our lead RN. Um, actually, I was on Amanda's hiring team in 2017, 2018. Um, she also represents not only an RN in our district, but also a parent in our district. And I will tell you from day one, Amanda, who was placed at Great Oak initially, um, really stood out. She stood out for a lot of different reasons. Her problem solving, her compassion, the care she has for our students, for all students, particularly our special education students. And for anyone who would decide to come on board as the lead nurse during a worldwide pandemic, <laughs> I actually remember having a conversation with Amanda while we were both kind of sitting on our couch one night um, and Zooming with each other and seeing if she was interested in this. And she said yes, and I could not be more happy. So Amanda's actually been in our lead RN position for less than a year, but I will tell you, and I, I get emotional about this, she has been the backbone of what has happened in regards to our students and the COVID response. She has been a backbone since day one her expertise, her problem solving, her think outside of the box ideas have really saved us. And she's talked me down off the ledge a couple of times, which I'm appreciative for as well. But as one of the employees in our, in our office um, said, Amanda has been able to turn around a nursing department during a worldwide pandemic and has done so with grace and professionalism. And right now she has been the backbone of what has happened in our department during a really difficult time. And I think that um, I know Mrs. Jilek is, I didn't see Mrs. Jilek here, but I know Mrs. Jilek would agree that there's been so much collaboration with the risk management department. So I know I can speak for Mr. Caponegro and Mrs. Leone, myself, and I see Mrs. Osteen over there, that um, we would not be the same without you. So congratulations. Um, so I have to give a shout out to my husband who's currently on college visits with our son. That's a senior in high school. Um, he holds it down at home and um, without him, I don't think that I could be on the phone as much as I am with um, Mrs. Velez, Mrs. Leone, <laughs> and Mrs. Osteen. Um, this, I'm so honored to receive this award, but um, I don't know two other people um, in the world that work as hard as the two women that are representing my family members tonight. Um, and Kimberly, for always answering my late night text messages and phone calls and, and problem solving with me quickly. Um, I don't really know, I wouldn't be successful in this position without the team that we have around us. I get emotional talking about it, it's been a rough year. Um, I appreciate, for every administrator watching this, um, for those that I didn't know and I've met via Zoom and I've, I've completely upset your already upset world this year, um, I appreciate every single one of you for being patient with me, um, learning with me, ex uh, accepting the curveballs that are being thrown um, your way. So um, shout out to all of our TVUSD administrators and um, I I'm so thankful to be here and to be a part of this team and thankful for um, my peers that I have around me. So thank you very much. And Mrs. Lash will now come up and introduce our classified employee of the year.
Okay, that concludes our employees of the year. And I think that that's just a, a, an incredible sample of the dedicated, amazing staff that we have. So one more round of applause for all of our employees of the year. <laughs> so well done. We have one more recognition this evening. So I'd like to invite Mrs. Miller, our principal of Chaparral High School up to the podium to talk about the Chaparral High School mock trial. Thank you, good evening. Tonight, I just wanted to recognize our students at Chaparral High School and our club advisor and our many adults who help our students participate in the mock trial each year. And even in the pandemic and not being on campus in person throughout the year, our students did an amazing job going on mock trial through Zoom. So they endured um, through that and pushed through and they went to their highest level ever in our Riverside County mock trial competition to the Elite Eight and they did um, win second place, but they did such an amazing job. And I'm so glad that I was able to still see it, it even in my car on Zoom, it was amazing. Um, but they just have worked so hard. And when you watch them, whether it's on Zoom or in person, they really just kind of bring that courthouse alive. And these students have such skill. And I can't wait to see what adults they turn into and what um, journeys they take in their future. So I have with me today, Mrs. Linda Zimmel, our LCAP counselor. She's also our advisor. And she just does an amazing job with our students and her dedication just shines through. And we just appreciate having her on campus to give our students this opportunity um, that they had this year. So um, I want to present Mrs. Zimmel and have her just share a little bit about mock trial and our students. And I think there's some photos to share too. Thank you, Mrs. Miller. Um, just like everyone before me, I, have, I cannot take credit for any of this. I am a glorified secretary <laughs> for our students and the attorney coaches that um, work with them. I can't even count how many hours we spent on Zoom. Um, it was very daunting and just knowing that these kids had been on Zoom for the whole day and then they still showed up in the evenings for hours. <laughs> and I'd always have to tell the attorneys, remember they've been doing this all day, <laughs> let them go. But here's a picture of our group this year. Um, the attorneys are here. My husband, Jeff, is the lead attorney. Uh, he's actually a judge for Riverside County along with our two past mock trial attorneys, they came back this year, they've had a baby, so they took a few years off, but Angela and Ryan are married and they are public defenders for Riverside County. And then what's really awesome is Dan Vinson, he is a parent at Chaparral, who has really taken a lead position as well as an attorney. Last but not least, um, my son who just graduated from Oregon, he participated in college mock trial and he also was present for helping the kids on a weekly basis, um, just kind of getting um, a different perspective from someone who actually had been in competition. So um, tonight you're also gonna meet Jaden Dew and um, Ethan Weldon, he's up in both in the corners there. They're our new president and vice president for Chaparral, so that's exciting. And I don't know, I just cannot say enough. We just had a super strong team and we just took one day at a time, one competition at a time played the top, one of the two top schools that win all the time are Poly and MLK. We beat Poly in competition, so we were already happy about that in the Elite Eight. And then to go to the final against the other top school, MLK, we didn't win, but um, hopefully we'll get them next time. <laughs> hopefully I'll be back here next year. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have a certificate for you with Mrs. Broche. There you go. Okay, I think that concludes uh, the recognitions part of our evening. Typically, we would have cookies and punch for you, but we don't due to COVID. So you are welcome to socialize for just a minute or two, of course, with masks and six feet apart. And then we'll open the doors and let the general audience in for open session. Congratulations again to you all. Good evening, the board has finished up with our recognitions tonight and we'll move into the open session of our business meeting. In attendance, we have the governing board, myself, Barbara Broche, Mrs. Sandy Hinkson, 
Mr. Steve Lohner, Mr. Stephen Schwartz, Mr. Adam Skumowitz, the Secretary to the Board, Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent, Mrs. Nicole Lash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Services, Business Support Services, Dr. Karen Valdez, Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services, Mr. Frank Arce, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources Development, Mrs. Kimberly Velez, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services, Mrs. Sue O'Connell, Executive Assistant to the Superintendent. Mrs. Hinkson will now lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. At approximately 9.30 p.m., the Governing Board will determine which of the remaining agenda items can be considered and acted upon prior to 10 p.m. and may continue all other items on which additional time is required until a future meeting. All meetings are scheduled to end at 10 p.m. Mrs. Hinkson will now read out action taken in closed session. In closed session, it was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Skumowitz to approve the settlement agreement and release 2020100509. The vote was 5 to 0. We'll move into our student spotlight. This is our first in person student spotlight, and CHS is up first.
Next up, we have Great Oak High School with Jordan and Rayla. Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see everybody in person. Hi. <laughs> Um, I'm Jordan Mackey. Um, unfortunately, my co-commissioner couldn't make it tonight, but I'm super excited to be talking to you. Um, and in person, it's super crazy, it's super weird not submitting a video, but it's super nice being in person today. Um, it's been pretty amazing being back on campus to see everyone, masks and all. Um, and I'm sure the feeling is mutual for all the schools. Um, it's been amazing seeing everyone's bright and smiling faces. Um, and being back has proven to produce stimulating conversations between classmates and our teachers. Um, we have also had so much activities with our sports and our extracurricular activities. And the spirit of the pack is still strong and we are so happy to be together on campus once again. Um, we are also trying our best to stay connected with our students who are virtual, or as we like to call them, our Zoomies. Um, our WSB, so what our WSB is currently working on um, is we're advertising for events that just got approved. Um, our WSB presidents are planning a social distance movie night for our seniors, which we're super stoked about. Um, they are hoping to organize one or two movie nights before the end of the school year. Um, we also received the green light for a senior sunset and a senior dance, um, so we've begun to plan for that as well. And we are so beyond excited to finally be able to celebrate our seniors. Um, the Winter Wish Committee has begun assigning the winter wishes to, the, to their cohorts, <laughs> um, so they can be given to the right person on the right day. Um, and we look forward to recognizing around 100 students. The Rallies Committee has begun planning the Spirit Awards, um, where each department from our school elect an outstanding senior that best represents Great Oak. Um, and our sophomore WSB has begun random acts of kindness, um, and they are starting to incorporate more in-person acts of kindness. So some things to be proud of. Our homecoming went really well. Uh, we had our homecoming court presentation as our halftime show and celebrated senior night for our seniors and our dance, for our cheerleaders and our dance team. Um, and the parents and students were so happy to be able to participate in such a fun event. Um, our academic decathlon placed sixth in the county, and our mock trial did very well. Um, our top attorney student in the county was our very own Annalise Steinman, and Dylan Agulon, I'm so sorry, I cannot pronounce his last name, but Dylan um, was the top clerk in the county. So super amazing, congratulations to them. This past week, um, football finished their season, and we're so proud of them. Um, our freshman team went undefeated. Our water polo team ranked second in league and our cross country team were league champions. Spring sports are back and boys varsity is undefeated and our girls boys varsity tennis is undefeated and our girls golf placed second in the Robert Murphy tournament. And last night, five of our athletes signed the national letter of intent and we couldn't be more proud of them. Our peer leaders continue to reach out to, our, to the feeder schools and strive to make connections with them virtually and now in person. Um, this week's challenge encouraged students with setting their personal goals and just getting back everything back to in person. Um, and I look forward to seeing more things to be opened up and to more events, so look forward to those as well. Um, thank you, and I'll see you guys next time. <laughs> up next is TVHS with Kelsey. I am a senior at Temecula Valley High School and I'm so excited to be back on campus. The positivity and friendly faces on campus has been refreshing as we continue to work hard nearing the end of the school year. The Golden Bears have continued to encourage our students and staff to stay connected throughout a variety of virtual and in-person events and we are so grateful for everyone's participation. Like Great Oak and Chaparral, many of our seniors painted their parking spots several Saturdays ago. It's always such a fun day as the seniors work so hard on their works of art. Despite the difficulty that comes with painting on asphalt, the results were so cool and definitely worth the effort. This year we had koi fish, planets, album covers, scenes of the ocean, Mario, lots of college logos, 
and a very creative QR code that when scanned takes you to a personalized website with photos of the student's friends. The first week back on campus had a different vibe. It was a lot like August, but less hot. We offered tours to our freshmen who have technically never been on campus. We painted our senior spots, and we had a home football game with an in-person gold day. There was music playing during every passing period throughout the first week, and teachers got to take us on a tour of their classrooms, including the location of their hand sanitized dispensers. I asked a few students what they thought about the first week. Let me read a few of their quotes. It makes you feel more motivated to get out of bed and wake up early. Before, I would wake up one minute before class and feel so tired, but now I wake up an hour earlier and don't feel tired at all and actually feel ready to go to class. You get out of your boring routine at home and it gives you an excuse to get ready. Another student says, I love being able to see people and teachers again, even if it is only their eyes I can see. They say eyes are the windows to a person's soul, but I sure can't wait to see people smile with their mouths again too. Another student claims, I like having social interaction. I've missed that over the past year. In ASB, we've begun work on many of our senior events, including Senior Sunset and Senior Awards Night. We're going to be celebrating all of our seniors who have committed to their future during our commitment signing event. We honor students who are heading to a four-year university, the military, a community college, or a vacational school. We're hoping to bring all of the honorees together, but just in case, we've got a virtual backup plan. During this week, all of our seniors are choosing who they'd like to sit with during our graduation ceremony on June 4th. It's a cool tradition as we were each able to be surrounded by our best friends throughout the ceremony. This week, we're also distributing our academic pins to all those students who earned a 3.0 or better and are in person. This year's pins are bears wearing a mask to commemorate their accomplishment in one of the most challenging of years. We also have our improvement pins for those students that were able to bring their overall GPA up by 0.5 or more. These pins have Smokey the Bear's face because after all, only you can bring your grades up. I have one for each of our board members that I'll leave for you. On Thursday, our ecology class is encouraging recycling on Earth Day. They'll be distributing a few tokens of appreciation for students who commit to recycle. We're hoping the campus looks a little bit like Chaparral as we break out our blue and green on Earth Day's 51st anniversary. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, ASB continues to put out our Bear Buzz newsletter to our students and staff. This has served as a strong way to provide the Golden Bears a shared experience. Obviously, it has a lot of updates and announcements, but we also include a lot of fun ways to participate and interact. Recently, we've included more information about Ramadan, Arab American History Month, Random Trivia, our weekly Mental Health Monday activities during Homeroom, National Pet Day photo submissions, Staff Member of the Week recognition, Student of the Day nominations, and Mystery Staff Member of the Week. We've also teamed up with the Black Student Union, who is putting out a daily newsletter linked in the Bear Buzz, entitled The Cultural Corner, covering a variety of topics and always with a link to a musical selection. We're very proud of what we've been able to do on campus, and we're excited about the selection of events up and coming for our seniors. Thank you, and go Bears. Next up, we have our TVEA Spotlight. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jeff Kingsburg, TVA president. I'm honored to provide you an organizational spotlight this evening. Uh, TVA continues to support our members by effective communication and representation, as well as recognizing those going the extra mile to provide support to others. We look forward to the TVUSD site administration team recognition event next month, acknowledging the exemplary support provided to our members over the challenging last 13 months. Internal to TVA, our executive board has completed the selection process for our 2021 
Executive Board Awards, and I will share those with you tonight. First, for the uh, 2021 CTA We Honor Ours Award, this is a regional level recognition. We have two TVA recipients this year, first bargaining chair, Brian Bolaris, and Executive Board Middle School Representative Lauren Davis. In other recognitions, we named our co-committee members of the year, uh, Mike Brewer and Christina Finney. They are both bargaining representatives at the elementary level. And we also have five super site leaders who provide site members a critical liaison to TVA. And our awardees this year are Belisa Guerrero and it from Temecula Laseno, Sherry Skinner from Tony Tobin at the elementary level, Chris Pepe from Margarita Middle School at the middle school level, and from high school we have Veronica Cubis from Temecula Valley High and Barbara Mueller from Chaparral High School. Uh, also, I want to share, we're going to be presenting Bella Vista Middle RSP uh, teacher Karen Hogan, an Outstanding Service Award for her multiple roles over the years as a special education advocate. We practice member advocacy and we try to maintain a sense of humility in our representative role. We also use deliberative processes before adopting a position on an internal or TVUSD initiative. An example of this is the fact that TVA has not announced a position on TVUSD's consideration of modifying in-person instruction for the remainder of this 2021 school year. Our bargaining team did meet with TVUSD last Friday to explore what might be the impacts and effects of such a change, and we will continue to do so and negotiate in good faith. Currently, we are executing a survey in which we will utilize member feedback to effectively represent any member consensus in the next negotiation session later this week. It's easy to assume a position for a prospective policy based on an individual's passion or that of a single community faction. Yet ev evaluating policy after having achieved comprehensive stakeholder feedback and charting costs versus benefits is more time consuming, yet it's also more responsible. Presuming as a community representative, the governing board is to provide direction to TVSD, supporting or not supporting a modification of in-person instruction. It would seem asking and collectively evaluating questions such as the following would be prudent. Here are some examples. Has TVSD communicated any potential changes to the community? Has comprehensive community feedback been facilitated, gathered, and reported? Do parents and families of our nearly 27,000 students view more in-person instructional time as a benefit at this juncture of the school year? If so, how does the schedule change impact potential family costs such as transportation and childcare? Does increased in-person instructional time at this juncture provide a benefit to students' social emotional well-being? If so, does it outweigh potential costs such as less teacher and individual student attention in a more crowded classroom? Does a learning environment with face coverings and larger cohorts inhibit effective classroom communication? Finally, organizationally, how is TVSD impacted by placing this topic front and center in the current district policy agenda? What are the resource costs related to our personnel? How might temporal costs impact planning for the myriad variables associated with a full successful return to in-person instruction in August. These are just a few of the potential questions to be fully addressed before the governing board should provide direction for structural changes in the late phases of the 2021 school year. Thank you. Next up, we have our CSEA spotlight. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is nice to be back in the TVUSD boardroom. It has been a long time since CSEA has had the opportunity to talk to you in person. A lot has happened since the last, our last spotlight. We have some new board members, and our, 
most importantly of all, our students have returned. I must tell you, our classified members at, at both the secondary and elementary education are ecstatic to have our kids back. Dr. McClay gave CSEA the opportunity to visit and assist with the opening of elementary and middle schools. I shared some time with Ms. Broch and Ms. Lash at the elementary school where the three of us, actually the four of us, including the principal, actually got very emotional. I'm a big teddy bear sometimes, and it was just awesome to see our TKs coming for the first time. I had to walk away because it was, it was, it was hard, but it was also awesome to see those teachers and our aides in that environment again. Uh, it, was, it was a great, like I said, it was a great feeling to see our students back and that they need to be in the classroom with their teachers and their aides. We may have different ideas of what this looks like, but that's what the negotiation process is for. I do need some help to understand a couple of things. If the board has directed the negotiations team to remove the plexiglass from the classroom, why hasn't it been done? Why haven't they led by example and have removed the, the plexiglass from this very boardroom? We believe our two students, we believe our students and teachers and classified are as important as our trustees and our executive cabinet. We agree to the electrostatic spraying that should stop during our AB classes at our elementary level. The spray was making our staff sick. I have stood here and online repeatedly explaining to all of you that the sprayers are a problem with our night custodians. Breathing problems, nosebleeds, and having the same symptoms that helped make the decision to stop spraying during the day. Are you aware that a custodian had a life-threatening reaction to the chemicals used? This custodian was ambulanced from the urgent care to Rancho Springs Medical Center. Completely remove the sprayers from our district. We are not a sticking point. We are not a number. We are not your disposable heroes. We are the men and women of the Temecula Valley Chapter 538. We are the backbone and the heart of this district. Without the classified employees, this district would not function. Thank you and have a great evening. Do we have anyone representing PTA tonight? Okay, we'll move into our public comments. The governing board welcomes public comments. This is the time for open session public comments. Any person wishing to provide a public comment to the board is required to attend the meeting. Public comments will no longer be read out loud. Public comments are allowed up to a maximum of three minutes per comment in the order received to a maximum total time of 30 minutes per item for comments on agenda items or non-agenda items. For consent agenda item topics, a limit of three minutes total will be allowed from one speaker. Unless the item has been placed on the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act, there'll be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personal issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful consideration by the governing board. Tonight, we're combining all of the public comments into this time now, and because we only have one agenda item, um, we'll just do them all at this time. First up, we have Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal. I have five children. I have a sophomore daughter at Great Oak High School. I have two kids at GMS in middle school and I have a second grader at TLES. I just wanted to describe to you what my daughter's first day experience was back in school. She's in cohort A. Um, her first period is dance PE. She's not allowed to use the locker room as those are off limits right now. So she had to come dressed in her PE clothes um, and remain in them the rest of the day. Her dance teacher is not teaching in class. So she came to the auditorium. There were two other students in her cohort. So the three of them viewed their dance teacher's instruction from the TV. Um, 
Her second period class was AP English. There were six students in the class. They sat behind plexiglass with the door open to the classroom behind them. The door shined onto the plexiglass, not allowing her to see the board. And the teacher sat behind the class um, in front of her computer with the Zoom and asked the students to put in their headphones and log into the Zoom. Um, I, my two middle schoolers um, had sort of a better report, I will say. And um, I appreciated one of my daughter's teachers in high school who actually has probably with his own money <laughs> set up about four cameras in his classroom so that the Zoom class could see his in-person class, his in-person class could see the Zoom class, and everybody could see um, the math problems he was working out by having screen sharing. Um, he wore a mask that was fogging up his glasses. <laughs> he was a trooper, and I appreciated the efforts that he made in comparison to the teacher who sat behind my daughter's class and asked her to join in the Zoom. I did contact that teacher, and she explained to me that they would be doing kind of five different variations, and that day happened to be where they had to do breakout rooms. Um, but my daughter said it hasn't really been any different. Um, my elementary son gets to go to school four days a week, which I think is fantastic. It's really tricky getting him to school and back in such a short period of time. I think it's like two and a half hours. My preschooler has been able to go in person preschool all year. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, he goes to school longer than all of my kids. Um, and I really feel like that four The four days a week has been so great for my elementary student, and I just feel like those more days of school would be so much more beneficial to my older children. And, um, you know, I just can't sit any longer. This is not comfortable for me. This is not, this is very much out of my comfort zone. But I just have to come here and give my voice and ask that you please do anything you can to help open the schools daily for our children. Thank you. Next, Aaron Lowe. Okay, thanks. Sorry, this has been a very emotional year. I am a mom of five children. My oldest goes to GMS, and the other three go to Temecula Lusanian Elementary School. My preschooler has gone to preschool three days a week for three hours since the beginning of the year just fine. My um, fourth grader the other day, on the first day back, came home and told me, I asked her, how was your day? How was it? And she said, it was good, but I didn't really get to talk to anybody because we have to keep space in between us and we don't have time to sit and talk. And then she said, but it was so nice because when I had a question and I didn't understand what I was supposed to be doing on this math worksheet, my teacher was able to come over and help me figure it out. She has had such a hard time this year with math. And I am not a teacher. There were so many nights that I stayed up late Googling common core math and how to explain it to my children and how to teach it to them. And it was such a hard year. My second grader does so well in school. But this last year at home was very hard for him. And he cried every day. And school often took six to eight hours to get him to complete homework. And we would just have to like quit. And I felt bad for the teacher because I really was trying to help him learn. These kids are so far behind all these private schools. And I just think it's so unfair to them how much they've lost this last year. <laughs> My kindergartner started learning how to write his name with his finger. 
and how to do all his sight words with his finger on an iPad. And I finally pulled him from it because it just was not working and he wasn't gaining what he needed to to be ready for first grade. So I pulled him out and I did homeschool with him. I just hope that you guys know how badly our kids need to be in full-time school and how it's mentally and physically affected them and us as parents. And I hope very soon we can get back in full-time because it is so needed. Thank you so much. Next up, we have Steve Campos. Oh, third time's a charm, right? <laughs> oh, sorry. No, no. I'm starting to sweat. I might drop the mic. Just kidding. I have been teaching in Temecula for over 15 years and 23 in total. During this time, unfortunately, I have never seen and heard of so many teachers having issues with administrators. I'm not talking about differences in educational philosophy. I'm talking about bullying, intimidation, retaliation, and discrimination. I personally have experienced it at least three times with district and site administrators. This is one of the elephants in the room that no one likes to talk about. Everybody wants to pretend like it doesn't exist or if we do not talk about it or address it, it will go away. When teachers are bullied, harassed, retaliated against, or intimidated, administrators are very good about making the teachers feel like they are isolated and the only ones with whom the administrator is having trouble with. They use their power to make you unnecessarily change your room or your teaching assignment just to make your life difficult. Sometimes they do it to the detriment of students by giving a teacher an assignment that they may be weak in. For example, a few years back, a teacher was assigned to teach a section of language arts even though there was another experienced language arts teacher who could have taught the class and filled the section. Instead, they assigned it to the teacher who had never taught the subject. This decision was made after the teacher had expressed their concerns as to why they thought it was a bad idea. The main reason was that it would negatively affect the student's growth in the subject in preparation for high school. Needless to say, at the time, that teacher was not in, a, not in the good graces with the site administrator. I would also like to state for the record that we were not the bullies. We were bullied, retaliated against, harassed, and discriminated against. That being said, many of us are extremely disappointed in the recent settlement with the former administrator who made the lives and jobs of over 15 teachers miserable for years. The winners in this decision were the law firms involved in the case, the administrator who was relieved of their duties as an administrator, and the district office administrators who were complicit in supporting the bullying, harassment, and intimidation of teachers for years. In closing, your decision to settle sends a clear message that you do not support your teachers. You asked all of us for help, and in the end, you let us down because it was more convenient for you. You have sent a clear message that you do not value your teachers because you removed an administrator from their position of authority, and then you turned around and did not fight for us to have our day in court. Thank you. Next up, we have Kimberly De La Cruz. Good evening. 
I'm reading this on behalf of my colleague, Stefan Stomachlatos, who cannot be here since he is an online all year teacher. Several years ago, I was contacted by TVUSD and asked if I would detail my story with examples and proof of the bullying and harassment that I faced while working for a particular administrator. I was hesitant because the five years I worked for that administrator were the worst five years of my 19 year teaching career. Although my seventh grade math test scores were the highest in the district while I worked for this administrator, it did not matter how well I did my job as that administrator put me through hell. When I came to the district for help in dealing with this administrator's disgraceful behavior toward me and others, the district did the bare minimum. Eventually, after many years of obvious fireable offenses, the district justifiably fired this administrator for all of the terrible conduct they were involved in. That administrator decided to sue the district, and ironically, when I was asked or contacted to help defend TVUSD, I decided to help you because it was the right thing to do. After spending countless hours with the district lawyer, being pulled out of my classroom when I would rather have been teaching, and dredging up terrible incidents while being assured that the district had no intention of ever settling the case, I received an email on Friday stating that the district had settled the case. It may have been cheaper to settle, but this should not have been about the money. It should have been do about doing the right thing. To me, this sends a message that an administrator can bully, harass, and torment teachers and staff for many years to the point that they are justifiably and legally fired. But that administrator, if that administrator decides to file a lawsuit, TVUSD will settle with them even when they were the perpetrators of unethical and illegal acts. We are all extremely disappointed with the lack of support that you've shown your teachers, and this is something that will not be forgotten. Thank you, Stefan Stomachlados, GMS Math. Next up, we have Megan Townley. All right, good evening. Um, my name is Megan Townley. I'm an elementary teacher at Temeca Lilisenio Elementary, and I have three students myself in the TVUSD schools. I have a freshman at Great Oak, I have a middle schooler at Gardner, and a second grader at Liseno. Let me start by saying that this has been an incredible year. Typically, when I use that word, I like to use it in a positive, upbeat manner. However, I'm gonna stick with the, the definition, which is impossible to believe. As we reflect on these past months of online teaching and learning and hybrid teaching and learning, it really is impossible to believe that we have done this and we're still doing it. Teachers have worked tirelessly to switch gears to a whole new way of teaching. Students have shifted to online learning and parents have sacrificed not only their time but their jobs to support their own students at home. And now we have seven weeks left, a light at the end of the tunnel. I speak from both sides of the coin, and I'm gonna skip that because I just explained that. We have bobbed and weaved and we have monitored and adjusted, which you taught me in ECI training so many years ago. And both at home and in school, we have done this, and we're so grateful that students were able to go back for four days at the elementary school in, April, in March, and that our middle school and high schoolers were able to go back to two days um, in April after spring break. The opportunity to bring them back for four days now is fantastic, and I think we can easily open the doors of our middle school and high school. Um, and then we can bring our elementary back for more than 2.5 hours. However, I implore you to lay out all the facts to all parties involved, teachers, admin, parents, and students, and let them know that when the shift to the cohort model, because when the shift to the cohort model happened, it wasn't clear. I still, I am an online teacher for the remainder of the year and I still had my one o'clock cohort show up at nine o'clock because we have trained our students online to come to school at nine o'clock for the past year and now we shift them to one o'clock and that's really hard for six year olds to understand. Um, some teachers were strongly encouraged by their administrators to volunteer to choose the hype or the flex model. However, now, with the possibility of increasing our hours, it has been said possibly that our, high, or our flex teachers will now be high flex. And for those that don't know, high flex is when 
you teach in person to your students in front of you while simultaneously Skyping, or I would say Skyping, Zooming in our online learners, similar to what they're doing at the middle school and high school. Um, these teachers didn't know this was gonna happen, that they were going to one day be high flex teachers because there wasn't planning, there wasn't long-term planning saying what would happen if we opened for more, if we were able to open, which we now can increase our hours. Um, how does one keep the attention of our online elementary students while simultaneously teaching the students physically in front of us? Students should not be sent to school to watch their teacher work. They should be working with their teacher, with their peers, involved in their learning every step, including those online ones. Let the in-person teachers teach in person, let the online teachers teach online. When moving forward to full time, and hopefully we can be clear on that when the time comes, Consider the possible changes of the daily schedule and the effect it has. Is that my time? Oh, sorry. All right. Thank you. Please consider. Next up, we have Edgar Diaz. I'm here at Edgar Diaz, teacher at Gardner Middle School, also vice president of the T Temecula Valley Educator Association. And what I want to tell you, speaking in a mic here is a lot easier than doing it in class. I think you had the teacher just telling you what the potentials are for elementary when you're in front of a camera talking to 15, 20 kids and then having to walk around and interact with them and get them motivated and get them into conversation and then look at the chat and be able to see, hey, what are you guys doing? What are you involved? Because if you zero out on them, they don't participate at all. When you start talking about what are you gonna do for the rest of the year, please, let's start talking about some more specifics. Besides let's do this and let's do that, what does that mean to the teacher? What does that mean to students? What are the realities that can actually be done? Because a decision that you make here just saying, hey, we're gonna go back to this, what does that involve for the staff? What does it involve for the teachers? What does that involve for groups? What does that involve for cohesion? What does that involve for people that want to make a difference in kids' lives and it's making it difficult every single time there's a change that's being made. Now for middle school, high school, I could tell you, it'll probably be a lot easier. For elementary, as I've been looking at different models and how that can implement between teachers that are working with students that are in class or outside of class who have different types of cohorts, that could be a lot more difficult. I've been an elementary teacher for 15 years and I could see that very difficult for what I do in middle school now to have to do with seven, eight, nine, and 10 year olds. Thank you. Moving on to our consent calendar, all matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and all will be enacted with one vote. There are no discussion. There is no discussion of consent calendar items unless members of the governing board or staff request that a specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. We are polling number 17. Can I have a motion and a second to approve consent calendar items one through 16? So moved. moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Mr. Boner. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Are we tabling 17 right now or are we gonna have discussion? Well, I'd like to move that we table consent item 17 for future consideration. So moved by Hinkson. Second. Second by Mr. Skumowitz. And then um, for conversation purposes on this one, this is the item that's um, CTE advisory and CTE advisory committee bylaws. And so um, I actually have a few questions on that that um, hopefully we can have Mr. Dignan clarify um, between the bylaws that are being brought forth for our district and um, the ones that are produced as a sample from the Department of Education, um, California Department of Education. I just have a few questions on that and on the way that the agenda is posed for the committee and such. So if we could table it and bring it back to a future meeting, uh, that, that's the motion on the floor. So I'll call for the vote unless anybody has any other questions. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries 5-0. Moving forward into our information and reports, Dr. McClay will give us our COVID-19 learning update. Okay, thank you. Mrs. O'Connell, if you could pull up the slides. All right, so we find ourselves once again giving a COVID-19 COVID learning update. Um, the first thing we wanted to present tonight is that uh, quite a few people have inquired as to the enrollment breakdowns. And so here you have not only district-wide, but you have elementary, middle school, and high school broken down with how many students or what percentage of students, excuse me, have chosen to participate in the hybrid model coming to school part-time and learning from home part-time, and then how many or what percentage has chosen virtual. So you have those numbers there as, as well. I was also asked to provide uh, how many have switched models, meaning from what they signed up for originally when we polled the elementary parents, I believe was in October, and then our secondary parents uh, in December. Uh, how many have switched? Uh, the middle schools, interestingly enough, uh, have experienced students transitioning from in-person to online in the range of 75 to 150 per site. Uh, at the high school level, it's been a little higher. They've averaged between 150 and 200 students per site. We could hypothesize as to the reasons why, um, but this is simply the raw data. Um, and we are seeing the trend going more from in-person to online. On this next slide here, and this is what we hope to accomplish tonight, is uh, really addressing quite a few of the most frequently asked questions. These are what we uh, get the most of, and then I've got uh, some other things in here as well. We're gonna talk about just briefly how the current models are going. We'll talk about what the fall is gonna look like. We're particularly excited about that. Um, we'll talk about um, whether or not it's true that other districts around us are opening full-time. Uh, that seems to be quite a myth out there, so I want to uh, correct that. Are we trying to reopen even more, given the relaxing of the six-foot social distancing requirements to three-foot? So we're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, where we're at with disinfecting, where we're at with plexiglass, and then what our next steps are from this point. Um, and then you see down there where it says, thank you for the input. Uh, we've received a great many emails over the course of the last 48 hours or so, and I did wanna take just a moment to address that. Um, I know personally, I've heard from many, many teachers as well as many, many parents, uh, that I've, many of whom I've known for years in this district. Um, I, I first wanna say we appreciate their acknowledgement, uh, their continued support, um, particularly of how hard everyone has worked to get where we are. Uh, we all realize, of course, that we want more until our students are back full-time, um, as normal as possible, we won't stop. Um, but like we've seen really since the start of the pandemic, um, the feedback that we are receiving, the input that we're receiving continues to be rather polarized. Um, many are staunchly advocating that we do all we can to open even more this year. Um, others are saying there's only six or seven weeks left, 20 instructional days, and our families and children have been through so much change, um, let's hold the line. And so I simply wanted to start tonight by saying I understand uh, the passion behind each of those arguments. I believe we all do. And we firmly believe that every one of our staff wants nothing more than to be back in person full time, or at least to be able to offer that to our children. Um, but there are reservations, and I think uh, many of those are, are very reasonable, they're very rational, and it obviously uh, requires in-depth thinking, planning, uh, and communicating. So there's a lot we're gonna try and get in here this evening. One of the things we wanted to start off with um, were the myths, and, and really try and, and get you the factual information. So one of the myths I hear a lot is that we don't have to negotiate a change in the learning model. This is a little bit of a semantics game here because the fact is we must negotiate the impacts and the effects of any changes, and we are. We are actively collaborating um, very positively with both of our association groups to negotiate those impacts and those effects. Examples of what impacts and effects are, because I realize that's kind of vague unless you do this for a living, that includes start times, dismissal times, cleaning processes, supervision of students, and many, many more. So please know that we are actively engaged in that um, and, and, and really working toward that end. Another myth 
um, we could choose to go back full time right now. Um, I wish that that were true. Uh, I think we all wish that that were true. But the fact is, is that we are still required to social distance by six feet anywhere outside of classrooms. Uh, that's the fine print um, under that headline that says the, the restrictions have changed or loosened from six feet to three feet. That's only within the classroom. So lunch, recess, passing periods, library, drop off, pick up, all of those times when students are not in their classrooms, we are still held to the six feet, which basically means we cannot physically house all students at once or full time. Doesn't mean we can't get to more, and that's where we're trying to go, but it is the reason why, or one of the reasons why we can't be full time and just flip that switch immediately. Another myth here is that the district is advocating a full time return for TK through five immediately that would require students to change classes. Please hear me say, and this is the former elementary teacher and elementary um, principal in me as well, while we would love to return full time effective immediately, we are not proposing that we do any such model that moves students. Again, we are so close to the end of the year. These students have been through enough. You've witnessed it this evening by hearing parents themselves speak to that. We see it as teachers, we see it as administrators. They don't need more classroom changes. So we are not advocating models that would require that we change teachers for our students. So um, I hope that, that I've, I've made that very, very clear. Another myth here is that surrounding districts have already opened full time. I hear this one all the time and it's simply not true. I work with our districts in Riverside County every single day. We also work with districts in Orange County and San Diego. We all know that they've had different rules over the course of the last 13 months, different county public health directors um, that have held different counties to different standards. But in our county, we remain one of the first to have reopened to any in-person learning. In fact, we were the third district to do that. Some of the districts in our county, I believe the number is seven or eight as of today, are still only offering virtual. We are also one of only a very few number of districts in our county who are exploring options to expand. Many have simply said it's too close to the end of the school year. We're not going to make any further changes. So we continue to work toward bringing our students back even more. And then the final myth here is that TVUSD doesn't know if we can reopen full time in the fall. Please, if you hear nothing else tonight, hear me say loudly and clearly, we have every intention of being open full time TK through 12 in August. We've received really good news from the governor. Um, as of June 15th, the tier system will go away and that we will have permission at that point to, to operate as normal as possible. So also uh, in June on the last day of school, all of our MOUs will expire, which were done specifically to, uh, to deal with the pandemic. So again, please hear me. Uh, in August, we do expect to be open full time and we are planning full steam ahead right now with all of those preparations. So I promise to talk just briefly about how the current models are going. As you will recall, we opened our elementary sites on March 15th. Uh, it seems like a really long time ago, but it's been 13 school days. Uh, today was day 13 for those kiddos um, and it has gone splendidly. The middle schools and the high schools opened just after spring break. Uh, which was actually Tuesday, April 6th, although they started asynchronously on that, uh, that Monday. That's nine days total, but because they are in a cohort where they only come two days a week, cohort A finished their fifth day today of in-person attendance, cohort B finished their fourth day. So um, we are exceptionally proud of that rollout. It has been uh, nearly seamless at all 26 of our open sites this year. So. Kudos to our teachers, our support staff, our administrators, and everyone who has worked so incredibly tirelessly over the last 13 months to see that happen. I did include the schedules here, but I don't think we'll go through them. I just wanted to remind you that currently our elementary students are coming in person if they're participating in that program two and a half hours per day, and then an hour and a half asynchronous for a total of four hours. Our online students, also in an effort to be uh, uh, equitable, receive four hours of instruction, both synchronous and asynchronous uh, during their uh, week of classes. And then because we have the privilege up here of being able to go into the schools, and I know many parents don't, we wanted to put just a few pictures up here. 
Um, I realize that, that most people don't get to see the insides of our schools and they're nervous and worried that they aren't friendly or inviting. And I can tell you absolutely with 100% conviction, they are just as inviting and friendly and fun learning environments as we see at a typical year. Uh, lots of smiles, lots of excitement, lots of fun activities. Our teachers uh, and support staff have gone above and beyond with making those environments incredibly welcoming. The middle school students, as you know, attend two days per week uh, in class if they are in-person students and two days asynchronously at home and then that cohort flips. Um, it also is equitable with the online students. So we heard tonight um, several comments about merging those cohorts and that is definitely a model that we are exploring vigorously. A few pictures here from the opening of our secondary uh, sites. You'll see uh, Day Middle School, you see Margarita Middle School, and then I know one of our favorites that day was the Bella, Bella Vista Middle School Band uh, playing as the students came back, and that was, that was quite a scene. I know Mr. Enrique's talked about tearing up as seeing the TKers come back in. Um, the same thing happened at all of those sites, seeing how excited the students were to have that opportunity to be back uh, in class. The high school schedule remains almost identical to that of middle school, um, but we wanted to uh, show you uh, some pictures here. You heard one of our student reporters tonight mention roomies and zoomies, and that's kind of a, a definitely a, a new COVID uh, term in education. Our roomies are our students who are in class, and this is a, a perfect example here of a picture where a teacher has students in front of her. She has some roomies as well as some zoomies, and you see the students who are participating remotely, you can see them on the screen there. That's kind of what it looks like in those secondary setups. A few other pictures here just to give you an idea if, if you aren't able to see it in action. Um, you've got uh, some chorus students outside practicing. Uh, you've got um, all kinds of, of lessons throughout the campus utilizing space in very different ways. And then I would be remiss if I didn't remind us that we have 3,000 employees. We are the second largest employer in Temecula. A lot goes on behind the scenes and a lot has gone on the last 13 months uh, to really reinvent how we have been providing uh, teaching and learning. And so you see some of our amazing support staff here at work, making sure that we have food for all of our students, making sure that we've got buses ready to go, that our, our services are all ready um, and that our sites are all ready. So one of the most popular questions I hear, what will the fall look like? Hopefully you already heard me say, it should look as normal as it possibly can. The tier system is about ready to go away. At least that's what we're being told on June 15th. Um, we do expect to offer that full-time in-person instruction to all who want it. And then we will also have alternative instructional programs available to select from, because of course, we have been hearing from folks that you know, this worked for our family this year, or this worked for one of my children, and, and they want to continue that. And so um, we're lucky tonight, we actually have Mrs. McKay in the audience uh, for another agenda item, but Mrs. McKay will be leading our Home Instead Innovation Academy, which will be the TK through eight home school option for our students, which we're super excited about. We'll also have at the high school level what we're calling some flex options. Um, and that means that students from our Alternative campus will be able to push into comprehensive campuses for certain classes, as well as students on the comprehensive campuses will be able to take one to two classes online if that is something that has, has worked for them. So we're really excited about those options. Also, we wanted to talk just um, as, you're, as you know, on March 19th, I believe it was the Friday that we all broke for spring break, uh, we got the news about the social distancing change from six feet to three feet. So some of the progress at this point, we have been actively negotiating, and you heard that this evening uh, in regards to the disinfecting and the spraying. Staff has agreed to move away from this process between the AM and the PM sessions at the elementary levels we're in the process of finalizing what that cleaning will look like because obviously there still needs to be some cleaning in between, um, but we have been successful at getting that um, out of the midday process. Um, in regard to plexiglass, this is an interesting one um, because we know that that is technically still above and beyond and we've tried to really commit ourselves this year to not, not going above and beyond what the state or the CDC has recommended. But in regard to plexiglass, we're gonna hold on this at the moment and that's because staff wants to finalize how many students will be in each room at any given time uh, with a, a model revision. So if we are to revise the models, 
Um, before we decide to take down the plexiglass, our staff has asked to know, well, how many students will we have in those rooms? And so, in other words, if we alter the model to one that has more students on campus more of the time, as we've proposed, we would make plexiglass revisions at that time. And this was a request made by uh, one of our associations, and it, it makes very good sense to us that we hold just temporarily until we can get that worked out. In regards to, oops, I went too fast. Athletics and activities, just real quickly, um, we are in full swing with athletics um, and how exciting it was for me to, to get a bunch of pictures and to be able to attend some matches and games, all of us for that matter, uh, to see our kids back out there doing what they love to do. And as you all know, this is, this is one of the things that connects a lot of students to school is to have that sport or that, that co-curricular activity that they are passionate about. And so I do wanna remind all of us that the state allowed athletics to come back in far sooner than classrooms. I know that seems contradictory to many people. Why are we allowing so much with athletics prior to in-class instruction? Uh, that was a decision that we again made because the state was allowing it. Um, and we recognize that, that it is in fact what connects a lot of our kids to schools. Um, and then graduations and special events. An inordinate amount of planning has gone into this the last few weeks and will continue to. Uh, we're trying to create some special events for our seniors, our site administrators, along with our ESS team in particular, but also all of our, our district office administrators have worked really, really hard for consistency so that all of our schools are offering the same types of things with a little bit of flexibility uh, to honor their own traditions. Senior parking, you heard a couple examples this evening from one of the student speakers, uh, went beautifully last week. These are the other things on the list uh, for seniors that are coming up, including a traditional stadium graduation uh, with streaming opportunities for family members uh, unable to come um, or over the, the allowable ticket uh, slash, I would call it stadium capacity. So kudos to everyone who's been involved for all of the planning on these. There will also be fifth grade and eighth grade modified promotion type activities, again, to celebrate those students and, and their accomplishments. So we'll conclude with next steps, and this is probably uh, uh, the biggest thing on folks' minds who are watching online. We will continue to work collaboratively with our associations to maximize opportunities for our students. So in other words, we will continue to work at the table uh, with both of our association groups in the hopes of positively negotiating the impacts and the effects of being able to extend either the number of days students attend schools, particularly at the secondary level, you've heard that that uh, appears far easier than elementary, or the number of minutes in a day that students might be attending. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, as we said earlier, it is not our intention to move students, uh, especially at the elementary level. Uh, we firmly believe that as civil servants, we owe it to our community to continue doing what we can to maximize the in-person learning for our students. So um, again, we will honor though, one of our earlier priorities, which was the least amount of disruption. So I wish we had definitives at this point, uh, but please know we are actively pursuing these adjustments uh, that again would extend the learning time without moving students. Um, other things we have uh, right now that are also taking a lot of attention, um, obviously, uh, and I realized earlier I didn't include probably the most critical one is the planning for the fall. Uh, so really that should come right underneath that green line. That is a huge priority right now is planning for a full-time uh, normal return in the fall. But in addition to that, we are trying to expand our summer school opportunities to make up for some of the losses that students may have instructionally or, or their social emotional needs. We are finalizing the reopening of Rancho Elementary, which you know has been closed this year. We are continuing to develop the Home Instead Innovation Academy, planning those 912 flex opportunities that I mentioned. Um, the three uh, plans that Dr. Valdez spoke so eloquently about at our last workshop uh, that need to be submitted to the state very, very soon. We are finalizing curriculum for 21-22, uh, keeping in mind that we realize our students will come in with gaps in the fall. And so that is going to require some adjustments. And then of course, we're making determinations about what the daily schedules look like, uh, particularly at the secondary level. There's been a lot of dialogue about that. So that was a lot of information. Again, I wish I had more definitives, but we are definitely working in the right direction and seeing progress. So. Thank you so much. Um, we'll start on the end with Mr. Leonard. Questions? 
comments? Uh, yeah, just a couple comments. And, uh, you know, I think I would echo um, just about everything that uh, Dr. McClay had to say. You know, let me start by saying that that I know our teachers have done a fabulous job over the last 13 to 14 months. Um, and from talking to many of them, it's been as difficult for them as it has for many parents in this district. Uh, my house is no exception. Uh, I often make reference to the fact that as a father of four children in this district, I'm very intimately aware at the difficulties that many families are facing right now. And it really is the crux of why I ran for this position in the first place. With that said, I'm not sorry that I ran and I wouldn't change a thing. In fact, I think this was the best time for me to be in this position at this moment. Um, and I couldn't be prouder uh, to be the best representation I can for the role of a board member to ensure that the school district is responsive to the values, beliefs, and priorities of this community, something that we hold uh, dear in our governance handbook here. I want you all to know uh, that I took that oath and I take this responsibility very seriously. And all of the decisions that I make are certainly based on the foundation that we maintain the best interests of our students first, their families, and of course, the employees of this district while maintaining the best education possible as the keystone for those decisions. Now with that said, I've spent the last 13 or 14 months, uh, I'm, I'm a captain with a local fire department. So as a leader, leader in my organization, I've spent the last 13 or 14 months very intimately aware of what COVID's done to our community and the fallout that's happened as a result. Collateral damage that most of you will never ever see and thankfully so. With that said, there's times when it's easy for me to reference my own family but then when I hear uh, Crystal, mom of five, but especially Aaron, mom of four, it's absolutely heartbreaking uh, to hear their stories. They don't understand, and they're trying to grapple with this the best that they can. And as leaders in this organization, it's very easy for us to tout how well we do when the grass is green and there's rainbows in the sky. But when catastrophe hits and when people are looking to us for leadership, that's when we earn our money and that's where we earn our moxie. And I would implore everybody in this room to understand that it's not about us acting as adults for the best interest of these children. It's us acting as leaders for the best interest of this community. Children, parents, teachers, everyone in this room. We all have this collective saying that we like to use that it's at the end of the day, it's all about the children. We have an opportunity to prove that right now. And I couldn't be prouder to represent this district. I couldn't be prouder of everyone in this room. With that said, all of us in this room have a boss, generally that sits in this room, except for the five of us, which puts us in a very difficult position because our bosses all sit outside of this building. They're the ones that voted us into this position. And I can't reiterate enough how honored I am to be in this position, how much I understand that your plight and how much I understand and it is my hope and intention to bring all of the components of this district together to help with that, to make the best decisions possible for everyone collectively. Um, and that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I don't want to be too redundant and uh, go over everything that Steve has said, but uh, one of the reasons I decided to run was that I was a teacher and an administrator for 35 years. Um, I have, don't have children in the community, but I do have grandchildren who go to school in California, and I felt that my experience and my knowledge could be helpful. I probably got 100 emails from parents teachers, uh, different community members in the past couple of days. I try to answer everyone. And one of the things I have tried to do in my school visits and in my communications to parents and teachers is that we're here for you. We're here for the kids, we're here for the parents, and we're here for the community in general. And if I represent any of you in my local area or if 
you're a member of another uh, school board member's uh, zone and you have a question or an issue, please feel free to reach out to me. I will always respond to you. I'm always available to try to help to make things better. And um, I, one of the things I found about this district is the amazing work that's done in the schools. I visited all the schools in my little area and I am constantly amazed by the quality of the administrators, the teachers, and the wonderful, wonderful children that live in our community. So I am there to support all of you. If you ever need anything, please reach out to me. I, I just, I'll do some comments and questions, I guess, go back to, um, first, I know that's like the, 12th COVID update, and I like that each time there's um, more specifics. Um, I know it's sometimes kind of repetitive, but I think it's important, and I think you did a good job, um, Dr. McClay. And I think um, each time we come back to these, it seems like we're getting a little bit more clarity. Um, my first response was, I think, um, excitement towards the fall, or for the fall. Um, I've heard so much about the technological gains we've had this year, which is fantastic. Um, the creativity and the flexibility you were describing of being able to do, you know, some online and some, you know, um, on campus uh, schools kind of being able to interchange. I think that's fantastic. And I think it's um, something that we can all look forward to. But I think the question that we're coming back to is what do we do now? Right? So we have seven weeks. What do we do? now about that and I'd say specifically um, I think um, we need more conversation um, with our community I think we need a direct phone call text message survey that goes out that we can get as much feedback as we can um, because I think when we're getting all these emails um, and all this information and public comments um, there's no question that everyone's perspective and experience is their reality and it's true and it's um, their experience and it's they're correct, right? The problem is we're all correct, right? So everyone has their um, perspective on this and we can't really um, make every single person happy, right? Our goal is to um, do the best we can and if we can get more feedback, if we can have um, deeper conversations or at least more information, I think we can make good decisions. I think specifically, uh, it sounds like the secondary, we could move on very quickly with uh, making progress. I think the elementary, I have elementary kids, I think it's tough and I understand that. Um, but but I, it's, it's a tough situation to go for six weeks on are we making a symbolic move or are we making something that's truly beneficial for kids to finish out the year and I don't know if there's a clear cut answer that we're gonna figure out tonight, but I think it's something that we've got to um, try and figure out. And then the last thing I'll say is I think the, the struggle with this, and that's kind of what I was saying on the perspective, I, it, it frustrates me that we're always, um, at least in this current climate, expected to pick a side, right? Like you're right and I'm wrong. Um, my point in saying everyone's perspective is, is right to them is, is how I feel and I think we, are honoring that, um, but I think at the same time, our job is to be able to understand that we can have opinions that overlap, that's not just one side of the street versus the other, and I think that's our objective is to find that pathway forward. So if we can have more communication with, with more parents, if we can move things forward as quickly as possible so that it's effective and productive for our kids and our staff, um, especially if we've got opportunities at the secondary level, and then we finish, so, Dr. McClay, you said it at the end, like this was our dress rehearsal to build up for the fall. So if we can finish as strong and as um, positive as possible, so kids are enthusiastic, teachers, staff is enthusiastic to come back in the fall, that I think is the big win. The big win is that our numbers and our heart and our enthusiasm in the fall is off the charts, which it should be, and it sounds like it will be, but um, those are my comments and questions, and well, not really questions. But. <laughs> Sandy. Do you have any other questions? That would be the time. No. Mr. Pinkston. So I don't have a lot to add to that. I'm pretty much in alignment with um, Mr. Skumowitz's comments. Um, I think that um, through all of this, 
um, the existing current board and the previous board, um, our goal was always to get kids back as quickly as we could and as safely as we could. And so, um, you know, this has been a year of, um, uh, as you referenced, um, a, a lot of different needs and families and a lot of different opinions, and none of those are wrong. And, you know, I, I sat many of hours answering emails last year and um, very emotional at, at what I was hearing from our families and the difficulties that we've all endured. And certainly when we first encountered this experience and had to close schools last year, we thought we'd be back at the beginning of this year. And so um, I think as we sit here almost, uh, you know, mid-April, um, it's just, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to look at the fact that we were able to open in some way by spring break. It's encouraging to think that we might be able to um, have the possibility of opening even more before the end of the school year. And certainly encouraging that our plans are to open full time back to school as normal in the fall. Um, that just feels like we've made so much progress and we're in such a better place. And I know there's still lots of challenges out there. And certainly, um, you know, just it's been constant. Just when one thing happens and we think we have a plan, something else comes up. So um, I do feel like we're in a whole lot better place. And, you know, as, and, and it's always important that we do recognize everyone has different situations. The, the board, I think one of the things that we really tried to accomplish last year was to produce models that gave people choices so that they could, it could best fit their life. Everyone's in a different place with the demands of their life, of their work, of their family. Um, if, if online works for their children, doesn't work for their children, there, there's so many different considerations. Um, you know, bringing kids back, students back, more in person at elementary, but then we have the students who are at home to consider too. That's more screen time for them if we're going to extend the hours. So, um, you know, it, it's very easy to just see your perspective in so many issues that have gone on in the world in the last year. But I think we all need to consider that we need to continue to be kind and see everyone's perspective. And our job as board members is really to make the decisions as best we can with all of that input and knowledge. And, um, and it's a very difficult job to make those decisions that try to benefit all of our students and take into consideration, um, you know, what's best for them educationally, social, emotionally, um, as well as our families and our community. So anyways, I know that's kind of a little bit all over the place. I completely agree with um, Mr. Skumowitz's comments and, um, and it, it just feels like it, I'm, I'm happy to be in such a better place at this time than we were a year ago. Um, but that's not to disregard all the challenges we still have. And just the, my final comment is just accommodation to um, really everyone. I, I, I can't say enough about our classified um, employees, our, our teachers, our administrators, um, our parents out there. Um, supporting their kids, and um, just th it, it, it's been so encouraging to have our community as involved as they've been and to hear from them in a way that we have never heard from them before and to have the kind of engagement that we have. And so um, that's always important to us. Um, so anyways, it's, it's encouraging, and um, you can see that we continue to move forward. So I probably don't have a lot to add because um, you guys all said so much. Uh, 13 months is when I think we started this. Uh, and never did I think that we would be in the position right now thinking that we're trying to still open schools. I think that that has been our priority from the first missed day of, um, of in-person school was to get our kids back to school as soon as possible. I'm encouraged by all of our stakeholders working hard to make that happen and working with the logistics. Um, Dr. McClay, I loved your myths tonight because 
as the spokesperson for the board, all of my emails have started out from parents or in teachers, rumor has it. So I don't know where everyone gets their information from, but there was a fair amount that was inaccurate. So I think this was something that everyone needed to hear tonight moving forward, especially the fall um, that we weren't coming back. So I'm so happy to ha have you do that. In regards to all of the um, correspondence that we're getting, that I'm getting right now, so it's probably been hundreds of emails in the past 72 hours. Some of the best ones have come from our students. I had a student by the name of Abigail. She is in the fourth grade. Um, she didn't, uh, Tony Tobin, I believe, at Tony Tobin Elementary. And she asked me a very simple question, why can't we open schools? And I sat there and it was the hardest email to answer because I couldn't really put it into words for our students to understand why. Um, so I, I think when we look at it from that level and it, it really made me go back and realize all of the challenges that we have every day, it's almost impossible. And I wonder sometimes what are our students thinking? And I wish that maybe we could uh, give some communication in our classrooms right now so our students understand why we're not open, why they're not on campus every day because we, we are really kind of missing that, um, that piece of it. And hearing from parents who are emotional, it's great things have happened, but this isn't working for a lot of our families and we need to recognize that and know that um, we understand that and it makes me emotional to watch people be emotional. Um, I don't sleep very well at night right now reading these emails because really we are, the, the governing board is one piece, so we have all these pieces working together and then we have our county health and our state of California. It's not easy, so those are my, my kind of my closing thoughts. I don't have any questions. I appreciate all of the answers that we received tonight. We can take a 10 minute break now. Okay, we're moving into our action items. I call for a motion and a second to approve the met recommended retiree health and welfare benefit for management and confidential retirees effective July 1st, 2021. Motion? Motion. Mr. Lohner, and a second? Second. Mr. Schwartz? Second. Is there a discussion on this item? Yeah, I have, I have a few questions on this one. Can we bring up the actual document? So I know I sent in a couple questions. My first question on this is, oh, I did not. Um, is this, is this um, a replacement document, a new document? I, I know Management Confidential doesn't have a contract, so I didn't know, is this, is this a new creation or a replacement to an existing document? That's my first question. So great question. Uh, this is not new, management um, has, uh, management and Confidential have part, been able to participate in the Bridge Medical Program since its inception starting in 2015-16. What happened was we've over the years made revisions to classified and certificated Bridge Medical Programs since 15-16 to date and we haven't gone back and caught up managements to align with certificated and classified associations. But when we established this in 2015-16, the intent was to offer something comparable. So where do I find the pr previous document that this is replacing? I mean, it's not like when I go online and I'm looking for TVA's contract, CSEA's contract, I can find that language related to Bridge Medical. Where do I find their previous language so I can compare what's changed? I, I, it's in the board agenda item from back then, but I have it and I know HR keeps, has it as well and as does um, risk management, but we can definitely put it on our website. Yeah, I would like, well, I don't necessarily, I guess that's one, one part of this is putting it on the website, but really the question is, is as I review this, I want to be able to look at it side by side 
and say, what is it that we're, what improvements are we making to this language? What has changed from our initial language? I see that in the topic sheet, it says it's an improvement in benefits of, is it $400 for the year? So what the change is, is right now, um, what was established in 1516 was that the benefit would be a flat $6,000 per year. And that aligned with what the other associations were getting at the time. Okay, so I guess my, my difficulty in this right now is that um, I did a little bit of homework and I pulled, um, I pulled the TVA language. I, pulled, I tried to pull the CSEA language, which I could not find in the lo in, locate in the contract, and I asked somebody to send me that. I still haven't gotten it yet. I could not locate the original language for management confidential. And so there are pieces of management confidential that overlaps with both the other contracts, right? And each one has a different designated dollar amount. And so, again, um, that's not stated in the contracts. Um, and then I went on a search to find how much is that benefit for each group. And there are some documents online. Um, so if you are beginning to participate in that, you sign up for the Retiree Bridge Program. And so there's a dollar amount stated on each one of those. And so, um, oh. From what I see currently, the CSEA Retiree Medical Bridge Program is a benefit of $538.58 per month. Uh, TVAs is a larger number, and the current one for management says $500 per month. So on the topic sheet, it says it's an improvement of $400 a year. So. Um, but also in the language here, it's saying that it's going to be a match to one of the bargaining units, whichever one is lower. Right. So, um, it, so there are two separate bargained amounts, and those were established by when we looked at the financial impact of establishing a bridge medical and what made sense at the time based on when folks retire, where they land on the salary schedule, where their replacements come in, and what's a reasonable amount to offer to a retiree. For management, there is a law that states that, that management cannot have a greater benefit than the associations uh, in the same bargaining unit. So rather than giving certificated management and classified management two different benefits, we'll say we'll give them the same benefit, but it'll, it'll have to be the lower of the two of the, the associations. So the idea is that no, whatever we negotiate with our associations, management will keep up rather than having to continue to remember to bring it back, which we haven't been great about doing. So it's remained stagnant. Where CSEA started at 6,000 and it's increased by COLA every single year, TVEAs is tied to the lowest active HMO. So it's a, flat, it's a dollar amount in both instances we're saying that, that management and confidential would follow along with the associations as changes are made. Um, sure, I understand that. And that, that, that at this, if, it were to, if you were to retire in your management right at this moment, you would be getting the same benefit as CSEA because that's the, the lower benefit, the 538. But can you go back to the topic sheet for just a second? And I hate to ask you to go back and forth here, but so the topic sheet, when it says financial impact down at the bottom, so it's $400 per year, and I, I'm not really sure where that number comes from. $400 per year per retiree. So right now the difference is $38 a month from what is on that. I, I, I'm just going by what I found, right? It says man, uh, management confidential is a $500 benefit and CSEA is 538.58. Is that where that 400 is coming from, 38 times 12 or? It, yes, I, I got that, I believe, from um, our risk management department, but I believe it's that $38 times 12 months. So that's a little bit, it's not really 400, right? It's four, 456, doing some quick math. Okay, that's per retiree. So what is, do we have any project, I mean, do, can we project that out and say what is the cost? So we have our, our budget, you know, it goes up and down, but we budget about four managers a year that participate in this program? Four total? 
it, including previous retirees who are still each participants? Year. So each year okay. another four. And okay. then of the benefits only up to five years or you become Medicare eligible, whichever comes first. And the, the retiree gets the benefit based on what it was when they retired. It doesn't escalate up as Correct. It, it doesn't change. It's at the point of retirement. Okay, so I have a couple other questions. If we can go back to the document again, the attachment. So, um, um, so number one, um, the difference here is um, the number of years. So in the, on the second line where it says um, you have, in order to qualify, it's age 55 and 12 years. And, and again, I couldn't find the CSEA language in their contract, okay? So I don't know if it's a, on an MOU or a separate document, but I didn't see it online. So it, it's either my lack of being able to search for it I think it's a separate document. Okay. Yeah. Because it was part of a settlement agreement. Yeah, and, and I so did go through the MOUs that were online and I still couldn't find it. So anyways, this says 12 years, TVA says 15. What does CSEA say? TVEA actually has the ability to retire at 12 years as well um, through some of the revisions that we've made through MOUs. Okay, then that MOU isn't posted online either. Okay, and that's the reason with the 12 years aligns with what the associations are doing. Okay, so I guess what I'm asking for is I really would like to see current information be, so that I know when I'm comparing this that the language matches the other, um, matches bargaining groups and, and it's not, and what the changes are to the current language for this group, okay? And then the other question I have in paragraph one is, uh, let's see, am I looking at the right, yeah, I am looking at it. Okay, so it says no later than March 30th, and I think unless there's been an update that's not in the contract that I'm seeing online, TVA is February 15th. And I know we made some temporary changes to that, right? So is there a difference in that because CSEA says the 30th of March? No, there's two different deadlines. The, the, it's 90 day notification for a classified employee, which is what aligns with classified management versus, and I think the March 30th is carried over from the previous language. The original language said March 30th and 1516 for TVEA. I know we pushed that back later. I just didn't update it in management. Okay, and then obviously paragraph two says that it shall be the same benefit of the corresponding associations, whichever is lower. But when I go to paragraph three, I think that it says, um, oh, let's see. For those eligible retirees who wish to purchase a plan that costs in excess of the district's contribution per year, they may do so with the excess cost absorbed by the retiree. I think that that language is misleading because the district's contribution to the medical plan is, I don't know the current number, $873 or something like that. So that could be mistaken, district contribution versus the whatever this benefit is. I think it needs to be more clearly defined so that somebody doesn't say that means the district's contribution when I retired, which was $873 or whatever. But that's whatever not that the number. contribution to a retiree. That's the contribution to an active person. So this is the contribution to the retiree. But it says it cannot, the plan, let me read this. For those eligible retirees who wish to purchase a plan that costs in excess of the district's contribution per year. Right, so that's this contribution, that this bridge medical contribution. Yeah, I think we need to clear that up though because it it's almost sounds like it's the eight, the district's contribution. I mean, the language we use as, an, as, a, as employees looking at our medical benefit, the district contribution is that negotiated number, right? Mrs. Kingston, should we pull this? I, th I think we need to pull it for some, some, okay. some more comparable documents and, and there is one more, yeah, and then item six I had a question on too. I think that there's some language in there that I'd like and to And perhaps look at. that'll give time to get your questions answered because you submitted them early, correct? Pardon me? You submitted your questions already? I just submitted saying that I had numerous questions on this item okay. and most of it relates to just wanting to see the documents that I mentioned and being able to have a closer look at the language and how it aligns to the two different organizations and the, pr and the previous benefit that was described. Okay. 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 
So we'll move on to number two. Yeah, so we're gonna table this until we'll the next it. meeting. Correct. Okay. I call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 2020-21 slash 27, authorizing the district to encumber funds. I think so wait, we, we're gonna have to go back to item one. So um, I move that we table item, I, I move that we table the recommended retiree health and welfare benefit and management and confidential retirees effective July 1st, 2021. Is there a second? Mr. Schwartz, I need you to verbalize it. Second. Sure. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Number two, I call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 2020-21-27, authorizing the district to encumber funds for the next fiscal year. In a motion? Move. Second. Mr. Skumowitz and second by Mr. Schwartz. And can we have explanation to what this is? So every year the County Office of Ed doesn't allow us to put in purchase orders for the following year without this board resolution. Any questions? No, nope, pretty standard. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number three, I call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 2020-21-28, authorizing the piggyback of the CMAS contract pursuant to the State of California through the Department of General Services for the purchase of E-rate network equipment Slash labor. Need a Move. motion? Moved. Mr. Schwartz, Skumowitz, and a second? Second. Mr. Schwartz, does anyone have any questions on this? And luckily we have Mr. Romero here, so if I botch any of this, you can come help me out. But E-rate, <laughs> this E-rate equipment is for networking, um, and this is authorizing us to utilize a piggybackable bid, meaning we don't have to go out to bid on our own, but we can piggyback on somebody else's bid for this equipment. Any other questions? Just real quick, uh, and this is for the STEAM Academy? This is for the K-8 site location so that they'll have network access. So e even if we uh, utilize that property in any way, we'll start getting it wired f to be networked. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number four, I call for a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 2020-21-29, authorizing contacting pursuant to bid number 1819-SC11-01 from South Coast, Agency, South Coast, Coast Services Agency. Need a motion? So moved. Mr. Schwartz, and a second? Second. Mr. Skumowitz. Does anyone have any questions? Oh, I have a question on this one. Can can you please um, uh, let us know why it is that we need two additional school buses at this time? Um, my question relates to, um, and, and these are, are these special education buses? I, I do not believe so. I believe these are, I would have to double check. I think it said they're buses for 37 passengers. Right, I know they're full, right. They're full-size buses, and these are replacements of existing that are um, needing, it, it's time for them to be replaced. And it takes, I believe Mr. Osborne said, uh, four, sometimes even six months to get them here. So if we imagine we'll be back to full-time in-person instruction next year, we'll need to get these um, replaced. Do we have um, a continued need for the same number of buses um, with the, with some of our students transporting themselves now? We, yes, well, uh, even if we were able to retire some buses, it wouldn't be these. So especially if, um, 
again, like if what I said, what, when we're back to in-person instruction next year, the thought is that we would need these buses. And every year we've had increase for transportation, not decrease, even if our enrollment tends to be going down. Yeah, I was actually referring to, didn't we um, have an option for some of our special ed education students to provide their own transportation now that was reducing our um, transportation needs? Yes, so that that's actually really is what my question was related to. Does that then affect our need for the total number of buses we have and are these necessary? So the agreements that we have with our parents for transporting is only good until June 30th of this year. It will not roll into next year. So and I think what Ms. Lash is saying, these buses for next year, our agreements don't move forward at that point. So we would need the buses okay, to transport. And, and my assumption is, I mean, I don't, I, I don't know for sure, but isn't a 37 seat bus a, a, special, a special education bus? It's not a full size bus, right? Those are 75 or 90 seats, I believe. I'm just going back to my field trip. Uh, when they I are special. Buses. Yes, they are special ed buses. Okay. And uh, again, so I'm sorry if I didn't articulate that very well. Back to normal, we would anticipate parents would no longer be driving their own own children. We don't have that information yet, though. Correct? Like, are we, we going to offer that option for next year? As of right now, we are not considering it offering that moving forward into okay. next school year. All right. Thank you. I guess my only question is, is that we were, we didn't have enough buses. I thought in the past, do we need more busing? We're evaluating that. Um, and I know we do an entire meeting on the vehicle needs of the organization, not mm -hmm. only replenishment, but if we need new. A lot of the new buses, uh, Mr. Osborne has been trying to go out to get grants to fund those buses. And so I think it, um, for right now, too, is all that we're looking at currently. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Number five, I call for a motion and a second to approve the adoption of resolution 2020-21-24 to suspend the administration of the statewide annual standardized summative assessments for the 2020-21 school year. Call for a motion. Move. Mr. Skumowitz and a second. Second. By Mr. Schwartz. Does anyone have any questions on this? Wait a minute, I'm sorry. Can you, can, are we on item five? Did I miss one? We are. Did you, what did you just read? Did you read about textbooks? Uh, maybe my mind just was in the wrong place here. Um, no, this is about the standardized testing. Do you want me to reread it for you? We have a different It's two different things. Five. The title is commit revenues in the general fund balance, but the, the motion is for something different. The motion doesn't match the item five. So we, so okay, we need so to table that motion. That one doesn't apply. It's different than my script. Okay. Are we just going to pull this? It's the wrong motion. The item is correct. The motion is incorrect. So the motion is on screen. Okay, so are we pulling number five then? We have to table that motion or it's... Okay. We have to void that motion, I guess is what we're saying. <laughs> what do I do on my end? Do I... You are going to call for a new motion okay. to approve what it says there. On the, on the screen, correct? Yes. Okay, number five. I call for a motion to approve resolution number 2020-21-30, resolution of the Board of Education of the Temecula Valley Unified School District to commit revenues in the general fund balance. Move. Moved by Mr. Skumowitz and second by Mr. Schwartz. Probably need you but, to clarify what's happening yeah, right now. Like, yeah. <laughs> what, Thank what? you. You threw me off on like assessments. Okay. Um, That's so, what I thought. I heard the wrong thing. <laughs> like, wait. <It's> okay. <laughs> Uh, what this motion does, and I, I know this was initially um, brought forward, uh, or I was asked to bring this forward by Mrs. Hinkson, so um, when I'm done, Mrs. Hinkson, if there's anything you'd like to add, please feel free. But 
what this is doing is components of ending fund balance, if you'll remember, there's restricted, unrestricted, or assigned, and committed, and committed takes board action. So what we're talking about is instead of having things fall to this unassigned category where it's a lot more fluid, we, the board would make a commitment to put, place funds in an on, uh, ongoing basis for our technology needs and 1% for our, our deferred maintenance costs. So that way we can better plan moving forward on what that revenue looks like. During tough financial times, deferred revenue uh, is often what gets pulled to cover some of the other costs, and that's what's happened. It used to be a requirement to set aside 1%, um, and during the Great Recession, that went away. And so this would restore that 1%, which would be about just over $3 million. Right now, the board tries to commit, or not commit, I'm sorry, the board. The district tries to put about a million dollars towards deferred revenue projects just based and see what we can cobble together, but it's a more reactionary plan. This would allow us to better meet those facility needs. And I know if you've been on any of our campuses, our deferred maintenance needs are great because we've fallen so far behind. This um, board resolution would allow us to reinstate the six million that was committed a few years ago and commit to ongoing 1% for deferred maintenance each year. And then, like I said, commit those technology funds for the teacher refresh, the student refresh every year. One more thing to note is our technology needs have already been budgeted. They just were budgeted in another area. We, they're not committed. So this isn't to say that those costs aren't already built into the budget numbers you've seen for technology. It would just be putting them in a different category, if that makes sense. And, and essentially protecting the dollars that um, we've set those dollars aside to spend on technology. So, so this is something that's been um, kind of near and dear to my heart um, for the last several years um, is it, it used to be a requirement by the state to put one, was it 1%? Um, I think we put a half and they put a half. Um, so they gave us matching funds for deferred maintenance which is really all the maintenance for our buildings on campus. And so as we're um, finding ourselves in a whole different situation than we did a decade or two ago, we are now be becoming an aging school district with buildings that are 25, 30 years old that need maintenance. And um, when I first came on the board six years ago, we were in a position where there hadn't been deferred maintenance money for several years. And so a lot of things were just being ignored. And so we did, um, when things picked up and got a little bit better, we did set that money aside. And then when COVID hit, we pulled that um, commitment and said those monies might may be needed for something else. So this is a, um, an opportunity for us um, as we're finding that we're getting some support funds to put that money aside and commit monies to maintaining our campuses. And I guess my question really is, um, 1% is the minimum that the state used to say you need to maintain your campuses. It, what is your recommend, recommendation currently? Is that going to be sufficient? And I, rem, I, I I'm, I'm gonna back up just a minute. I remember Mrs. Ordway Peck doing a presentation for us where she talked about like three different categories, the things that are emergencies, and that was pretty much all we could handle. We're just taking emergencies and we have to, those are the things you have to take care of, right? Um, and then there's the things that are um, uh, the, the next category that aren't emergencies, but really have to be taken care of. And then there's the things that really should be put on a um, rotation and, and start to happen, right? So we've pretty much been in the emergency mode and just started to be able to touch with some very, um, I don't know, I guess you know, we have to really cut, cut through to the very minimum to um, determine what's the highest priority of the monies that we have. So uh, my, my, I guess my direct question here is, is 1% enough right now? And the answer from our MNO department would be yes. If we can restore the 6 million to help some of the backlog and commit to 1%, we think that's a great start 
because if I said it wasn't enough, I wouldn't even know how to quantify how much enough would be because of that backlog. It's hard to assess routine or each year at that point, coupled with if we move forward with this, what we've built into the budget would be increased by about 2 million per year. And so we would wanna see the financial impact overall of how this looks long-term. So what is recommended here, I think is truly our recommendation of a great starting point. Okay, so that's 3 million per year going forward. Correct. All right. And then the second item was the technology um, thing. And I think you put on here one and a half to two and a half percent. So I think that if we're going to do a resolution, don't we have to determine which one? One and a half, two or two and a half percent? Doesn't it have to be a defined number that you can put into the budget? I don't think so. I think the county will allow us to transfer funds into that committed resource, and it can be a million and a half this year. It would be based on that technology plan that I've shared, and it varies because I see what you're saying. things expire at different times, so it would be whatever the refresh cycle for that year would be, would be put into that restricted resource. Okay, so committed. it's based on a a plan that you've already drawn up that says what our needs are for the next several years and that varies between one and a half and two percent. So you have a defined number that you would put in for each one of those years. Exactly. Okay, thank you. That really clarifies exactly. it. Exactly. No. Any other questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries five zero. Number six. I call for a motion and a second to approve the new textbook adoption, Ariba Communication of Cultural Belief, 7th edition, by Zazas, Bazin, Bacon, Nybert, published by Pearson. Motion? Second. So moved. <laughs> Mr. Schoen, did you do the first? Moved. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Schoen, let's move the first and Mr. Wait, 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 I need that clarified. Who, was, who made the motion? Schwartz. Okay, second by Spoonwith? Sure, yes. Okay. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I call for a motion and a second to approve the new textbook adoption True Way by Purple Moon Tower, LLC, published by Purple Moon Tower, LLC. Motion. Motion. Second. By Mr. Loner and second by Mr. Schwartz. Any questions? Skumowitz. Skumowitz, I'm sorry. Same. Any questions? That's for um, sign language. Yes. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Number eight, I call for a motion and a second to provide notice of a public hearing on April 20th. 2021 regarding the joint initial proposals by the Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA slash NEA, and the Temecula Valley Unified School for Reopener Successor contract negotiations for the 2021-2023 school years. I call for a motion. Moved. Moved by Mr. Skumowitz. And second? Schwartz. By Mr. Schwartz. Any questions? Mr. Arthur, perhaps? Turn your mic on, he couldn't hear you. When does the current contract expire? Initial proposals. Oh, thank you. Is the time frame correct? 20 21 through 2023? Shouldn't it be 2021 to 2022 school year or is it multiple years? I have no one. I'm sorry. 2021 through 2023. Two years? Thank you. Right. Any other questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Call for a motion and a second to conduct a public hearing on April 20th, 
2021 regarding the joint initial proposals by the Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA slash NEA, and Temecula Valley Unified School for reopener successor contract negotiations for the 2021-2023 school years. Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Skumowitz. And second? Second. By Mr. Schwartz. Is there any questions on this? Just All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries 5-0. This is the time and place designated for the public hearing of Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA slash NEA, and the Temecula Valley Unified School District's joint initial proposals for reopener successor contract negotiations for the 2021-2023 school years. I declare the hearing now open at 829. Is there anyone present who wishes to comment Wait, on the Tim you, you skipped the staff discusses the item. Is there discussion? No, that's that was part of my uh, comment for the notice of public hearing. Is there anyone present who wishes to comment on the Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA slash NEA, and the Temecula Valley Unified School District's joint initial proposals for reopener successor contract negotiations for the 2021 through 2023 school years. A total of 30 minutes is provided so members of the public can address the board. Speakers are limited to three minutes. If so, please state your name prior to making your comments. Hi, Edgar Diaz, Vice President of the Temecula Valley Educator Association, and I would love for our, both organizations to get together and actually talk about non-COVID stuff talk about our contract and how we can get back to our school year and be able to impact kids. So with that, I'd like to say we'd like to, we look forward to reopening and we look forward to discussions after we can get past this year. So hopefully that'll be sooner rather than later. Thanks. Are there any other speakers? If there are no more comments, I will declare the public hearing closed. Public hearing in time is 831. Number 10, I call for a motion and a second to accept the joint initial proposals by the Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA slash NEA and the Temecula Valley Unified School for reopen or successor contract negotiations for the 2021 through 2023 school years. So moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. And second? Second. By Mr. Skrimowitz. Is this different than what we just did? Okay, thank you. This, this is accepting the... Okay, thank you. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I call for a motion a second to adopt resolution 2020-21-31, layoff in service of administrative classified employee coordinator of family engagement and CTE effective June 19th, 2021. Need a motion? Move. Moved by Mr. Skimowitz and a second? Second. By Mr. Schwartz. Is there any questions? Uh, yeah, just one quick question. So uh, if this motion carries uh, or is approved, how soon would something like this take effect? Uh, I, I don't know what the timelines are on it. That's June 19. A, 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 approval for oh, this yes. would initiate a 60-day process for this particular position. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. I call for a motion and a second 
I'm sorry, number 12. I call for a motion and a second to approve an increase in substitute teacher compensation to the proposed 2021 daily rate, option one, or the proposed 2021 slash 22 day rate of pay, option two, to become effective July 1st, 2021. Need a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz, second, second. by Mr. Skumowitz, and yeah, um, the, the board has received some information that's provided some historical context about the pay rate. Can, for can we see teachers. the document that, while yeah. you're talking? So before you, today is a proposal that would raise that sub rate currently at 115 for short term subs and 127 for long term subs. I'd like to call on Mr. Joe Mueller, our Director of Human Resources. Uh, development who will work to gather the data and make the proposal in order to answer any questions you might have regarding this particular topic board. I think Mr. Mueller, uh, you had a slideshow as well, right? We can't hear you. Mr. Romero, can I have the... All right, well, I know... Um, we have a busy night tonight, and so I will try to be brief here. Um, for your consideration this evening, we are proposing an increase to the certificated substitute pay scale and seeking the board's guidance on two different options. Uh, before looking at those options, I thought it important to provide the board uh, with some background information. Um, in August 2019, Human Resources Development provided the board with a historical, uh, historical overview of substitute compensation in the district. At that time, our substitutes had not received a daily compensation increase since April 2015. In fact, for the period between January 2001 and April 2015, daily compensation rates had only increased $10 per day. During the same presentation, we informed, uh, or Excuse me, during the same presentation, we provided information related to our eight comparison districts. At that time, TDUSD was approximately $14 off the average for day-to-day -day assignments and $21 off the average for long-term assignments. To address this discrepancy, we proposed a three-year implementation plan. The board approved the plan at the next meeting in September 2019, but asked that future increases uh, come back as action items. Due to, the, due to a variety of factors, including the pandemic, the 2021 increase was not brought, brought back at the start of the school year. Since reporting to the board in August 2019, six of our eight comparison school districts have increased compensation for certificated substitutes. Currently, the district is $13 off the average for day-to-day -day compensation uh, and $20 off the average for long-term assignments. As we plan for the 2020, excuse me, the 21-22 school year, we are seeking the board's guidance on these two options. Option one increases the day-to-day -day compensation from $115 uh, to $120, and the long-term daily rate from $127 to $134. Option two increases day-to-day -day compensation from $115 to $124, and the long-term pay rate from $127 to $141. Naturally, each of these options comes with different financial impacts, approximately $161,000 for option one and approximately $295,000 for option two. Again, tonight we're asking first for your consideration for an increase for our certificated substitutes and if that moves forward to choose between option one and two. Are there any questions? So I, I know that um, I've been a voice for our, our certificated substitutes. I think that um, just to share some information, um, uh, where if you look back to 2001 at $100 and where we currently are, um, or where we were before our last, last action at 110, when you look at the fact that it was, I don't know how many years that was, from 2019, a $10 increase over all those years. Um, it's a group that is unrepresented, so 
nobody negotiates on their behalf. And so they really were pretty stagnant. They got an increase and then they went backwards during the recession and then we restored it. And then we finally um, um, uh, looked at it and, and, and made that three year plan. So um, over the course of the years, when, when you look back to, uh, when I look back to my, my teaching time, when I came on in the district in 1990, and I think subs were making either, it was either 90 or $100 at that time. Um, minimum wage then was like $8.50 and they were making, you know, close to $16 or something, $15 I think. That was, that was a substantial di difference. They're making almost twice as much as minimum wage. Now minimum wage is up to 15 and, and our substitute pay is, you know, under $17 or somewhere around there. I'm not doing, I'm just doing the math in my head quickly. So, so they've certainly lost pace while our other groups have been able to negotiate and keep pace with inflation and improve their salaries. For our classified subs, I believe they are taken care of through the contract where whatever position they are substituting for, um, they get 80% of the lowest rate for that job. Is that correct? Uh, I don't have the specific percentage, but it is tied directly to the pay scale. So each time classified receives a compensation increase and then it, it the corresponding increase applies to the, to the substitutes. Subs. So the, the group that in, has been left behind is our certificated substitutes. And certainly as we come out of this pandemic, we're realizing the importance and the shortage and many of the people who subbed in the past, I mean, you can read it in any educational um, uh, information right now about that there is truly a shortage. Um, and a lot of our substitutes that with, went without work for a year have now gone into other work or become, you know, got ahead and bec uh, gotten their credentials and maybe teachers now at this point. So I, th I think it's, you know, it, it's long overdue and I, and I certainly would like to not only recommend that we make this adjustment, but maybe that we make a commitment that, you know, in the Me Too days, we gave an, an increase to TVA, we gave an increase to CSCA, and then we gave this, we, and it's still pretty typical, we give the same increase to management and um, uh, then, and, and um, administration, and then we leave behind our, our certificated teachers. So um, I would like to suggest not only do we give them an increase, but that when we do have increases that affect everyone in our organization, that we consider that they get the same percentage as well on an ongoing basis and um, that we, we don't keep forgetting about that group. <laughs> that, that would be, really be um, something I'd like to see. Can you bring back up that chart of our choices? So I think when I look at this and I see that our current is short term is 115, long term is 127, that's a $12 a day difference. And when you look at option one, it's $14 and option two is $17 difference. I'd, I'd like to propose that option two be 125 for short term and 140 for long term. So I, I, I guess we'll open it up for conversation and then um, I'll consider modifying the motion to that effect if there's, depending on how others feel. How did you come up with the dollar amount? Sorry, I might have missed that. So um, over the years, the district has used eight comparison school districts. They represent, um, pro you know, they're larger school districts in the county. So we took an average of um, those, those districts we, we want to be within that, you know, close to that average. Um, and so um, that's, that's how we landed there. It doesn't get us all, all the way, but it, it gets us close. Um, Are we experiencing a shortage or pre-pandemic, were we experiencing a shortage in subs? Or? So pre-pandemic, um, there's been a shortage in subs. There can, it, the need is increased. I will say um, we came out of the box with a proactive strategy. We assigned site subs, so we, we got them committed you know, five days a week at our school sites. Um, and so um, there's the potential. So far, we've been doing okay. There's the potential that we, you know, we could run into issues. Um, over the years, one of the things that we've noticed throughout the county is we've seen some districts significantly increase their, their substitute compensation. There aren't, the people just aren't there. 
So it, it didn't mean, you know, you pay $180 a day and all your problems are solved. Um, and so in, in uh, making this recommendation in 2019, we, we, can, we factored that in as well. We, we didn't see more money to be the complete answer. Um, so there is a shortage. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that by increasing to 125 or 140, that's gonna end the shortage. We, uh, we did have an issue with, um, I, I think this came up at Superintendent's Council a couple years ago, where teachers would call and get a uh, sub assigned to their job. And then um, before, like the day before or something, um, the sub would call and cancel and take a job at another, at Menifee or at um, Murrieta because they paid a little bit more. Um, and, and that's part of the issue, but really in my mind, the issue is um, fair and competitive pay. Um, I really feel like these individuals, uh, we entrust them to teach our children. We entrust them to, they, and, and they all have college degrees and have had to um, do some testing in order to qualify for this position. And yet I just feel like it's been um, something that's been ignored and they're, they're grossly underpaid. Can you bring that chart back up of the comparisons of the districts? I, I have one question and one, sure. Mr. Sure. Schumann. What is our lowest day rate teacher? Is, and, I'm, and I didn't ask this ahead of time, so you may not have this, you may not know. I'm sorry, what was the question? What is our, our, our lowest paid teacher who would utilize a sub? What is their daily rate approximately? Well, like an A1, do you have any idea of daily rate? I'd be sorry, I'm so sorry, I should have asked, I should have asked, okay, I should have asked that ahead of time. I'm, I'd be guessing, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait for the. <laughs> Mr. Skimlitz, if you have another question. I was just going to give comments and then step back. I would say um, I agree. I think reasonable and fair. It, it makes sense that it should go up. I think if it's relatively arbitrary, right, if we can add a dollar or take a dollar or it's an average, I think the benchmark is geographic rather than, um, you, well, you kind of did neighboring schools, but Desert Sands, and there's it's pretty far away, some of them. It makes sense to, to match Murrieta or geographically close because someone's choosing, you don't want them to choose our neighboring school district as opposed. So I would say, uh, I agree, it should go up. Um, I think option one makes sense or whatever's closest to Murrieta. And I think it's, it makes sense that it's reviewed every year to, to see how we can increase it based on our budget. Can, can I say the page again where it shows the options, how much each cost, the, what the total cost is? I feel like it's telling me the option one is, and then you can go back because I think someone else wanted to look at that. So one consideration for option two, just to put this out there, is we're going to change our pay frequency for certificated staff next year to match what every other district in the county is doing. And so to incentivize folks to take a job here, we might be enticed to go with option two um, right out the gate to catch us up. Uh, with the 124 and 141, um, just because of that change in pay frequency, it might impact our ability to get subs starting July 1st. Um, and if we fiddle with $1 less here and $1 more there, we have a significantly more, a significantly larger number of day-to-day -day subs versus our long-term. So that will impact, make that financial impact different. So just keep that in mind. President Brosh, uh, Mr. Arce has sent me a text. The daily rate for A1 is $282.60 per day. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Super. <laughs> Our secret's out. Can, can you show that three-year chart of what the board had wanted to bring forth before? There it is. So your question is, option one is, do we go to the 2021 number, which we kind of skipped because of um, what this year was, or do we move to um, what our plan was for the 21-22 year? That's correct. Mr. Leonard, option one or two? I'm gonna go with option two. Well, we're not, we're not voting right now. We would have to make a motion to... Um, well, why don't I... Why don't I make you, it clear you can move as, to, to, yeah. as to why I'm saying that? Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't pretend to be the expert in any of these arenas. I follow suit with what you all say. 
and I understand the need to attract quality, sub not only substitute teachers, but quality substitute teachers to our district. I feel like I'm looking at these pay scales and I'm matching them up to the other cities and we could talk about geographics, but the reality is if they can make 141 or 124 as opposed to a little bit less in our neighboring cities, I, I see the benefit in that and I would agree. So just to clarify, aren't we asking right now if the well, direction of the board? The, no? the motion on the floor that it says that you called for was compensation to propo propose daily rate option one or option two. So now we have to modify the motion to whichever option we want in order to vote on it. Right, so that's why I was asking what, what does everyone want so we can come to consensus? I was gonna say, uh, it's a two-pronged sword. First of all, this is a district where people wanna come and work. It's not like they're gonna have to, even if Palm Springs paid $50 a day more, people are not gonna drive from here to Palm Springs to work. Second of all, if we have long-term subs, they are basically our child's teacher for X number of days and mo a month, or, or it could be a whole school year. And if it's $141, they're earning half of what a first year teacher earns, and they might have 20 years of experience. So I think it's critical that we not only pay competitively, but we reward them for their years of service and their education, and we try to keep them here. I mean, they may want to go to Murrieta if Murrieta pays $10 more, but they're not going to go to Moreno Valley if Moreno Valley pays $5 more. No, because what option is everyone picking? Okay, yes, you can Okay. Okay, I move um, to approve an increase in substitute teacher compensation to the proposed 2021-22 daily rate of pay option two to be become effective July 1st, 2021. Second. Second by Mr. Schwartz. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Hmm? Number 13. <laughs> I call for a motion and a second to approve the Home Instead Innovation Academy CDS application. Moved. Moved by Mr. Skimowitz and second? Second. Second by Mr. Schwartz, and I think we're going to have discussion. So this is the application so that we can actually open our home instead Innovation Academy. This is our approval um, with the application with the state so we can actually um, have our CDS code. You'll notice that the application is um, through eighth grade, but understand that Home instead will eventually be 912, but the 912 is already covered under the CDS code at Rancho Vista High School. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Number 14. I call for a motion and a second to approve the new job description for the Home Instead Innovation Academy educational coach. So moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz and second? Second. Second by Mr. Skumowitz. Does anyone have any questions on this position? Mr. Sh I, I Mr. Schwartz? I have a question. We're calling the, is this person the principal with another name? Educational not, coach or no? Not necessarily. And actually the principal for the Home Innovative, uh, 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 for, for the Home Instead Innovative Academy, uh, Ms. Sandy McKay is joining us. At this time, we do have two job descriptions uh, before you for your approval. One is that of educational coach, uh, and the other is for virtual program teacher, T, uh, T K, K, K eight. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I think the question, uh, Sandy, was in regards to uh, educational coach. If maybe you can give the board a little context on that. Sure. So um, we're, we're offering uh, right now two options or two different programs. One of those programs is a self-paced module program, um, similar to being what's used kind of in homeschool. So there is no 
teacher teaching it's a self-paced module and so with that program um, comes an uh, educational coach they are the teacher of record um, that is supporting the parent and making sure that those students are staying on pace they meet with the parent and the student weekly to make sure assignments are done because we are falling under an independent study so it's about work completion um, for them and then they also meet monthly with them to design their learning plan and make sure that they're all on pace to stay um, with the curriculum. So they are the teacher of record for the, the self-paced module. Thank you. I'm sorry, and, and just real quick, how many uh, educational coaches do you anticipate needing? That all depends on enrollment. So and, and are we starting to get any idea of what that might be looking like? I think it's a little early to tell. Like we just started enrollment yesterday, so. Oh, okay. I, so there's I, been lots of interest. I've been holding parent meetings twice a week. Lots of people interested in the self-paced modules, so. But and I think Mrs. McKay is exactly right. We're kind of, we're starting with one and it's going to kind of depend on enrollments right now. As of um, just earlier today, since registration just opened on Monday, we currently have, um, Today we have 26 students who've enrolled, but 68 who've expressed interest who we're actually personally reaching out to. Um, the registration process is all online, so some parents are needing some assistance to kind of navigate that, so we're, we're handling those on a one-to-one -one basis by actually calling them. So it, we could be potentially looking at, with what the numbers we have right now, probably 100 to start um, in the next week or two. So for every 25 students, we need an educational coach. So they're, they're assigned every, every 25 students is their kind of their caseload that they would manage. So. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number 15, I call for a motion and a second to approve the new job description for the Home Instead Innovation Academy virtual program teacher TK through eight. So moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Second by Mr. Skumowitz. Does anyone have any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number 16, I call for a motion and a second to approve the board priorities for 2021-2022. So moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz and second? Second. By Mr. Skumowitz. Is there any questions? Are you, are you bringing the document up? We did. It's gonna take a second, we're trying to get the sure. document. Basically, sure. all we did was after our very last discussion, you had suggested a few changes. We made those exact changes. Um, and as soon, if we can take a peek at that, you'll see we removed the word draft <laughs> at the top. Right. Um, we merged priority one and priority two. We heard you say last time that they weren't in any particular order. So we just labeled them one, two, and one, two. We added three things under Safety, um, I believe, we added the safety director, we added uh, campus security, and we added campus hardening. And then we removed the two things that the board hadn't decided on yet, um, I believe about two thirds of the way down the page. So it was mission value, vision value exactly. and PD and staff retention. You sent it to me if that's helpful uh, yesterday, unless there's a different version. No, there's not. She's just looking for it. It's that attachment right there, there Sue. Awesome, thank you so much. There you go, just like I said, we made them both number one, two, took off draft, added the three things under the safety um, specific targets. And then if you'll scroll a little bit farther down, we removed those two items in blue as well. So um, I have a couple questions. So on um, I, the first item, 
the first one, two, safety and behavioral, social, emotional. So it says coordinator, director. Should, should we add the word safety on part of that? Safety coordinator, director, isn't that what we're... I'm happy to do that. We had it under the category of safety, so uh, I just took specific notes from yeah. your last meeting, but if you'd like it to say safety I, after. I think so, yeah. And I think in one more item, item number 17 on the agenda tonight, if you decide it's a director, we can take off even coordinator on that line. Is, is that position called safety director or is it to have it's a different title? director of safety and security if it's approved. So maybe we should use the same we title. We can make it identical if that's what you'd like after the next item. If that makes sense. And then the other item I think is item three, where we have the, it says, it's a little confusing, I think. It says current 2.25 above. Can we, can we put in current 5.25 and then in parentheses put 2.25 above? If you'd like us to. Because that defines what, where we're at, at 5.25. And is the required 16.6 .6 million, is that what it is at 5.25, Mrs. Lash? Okay. That's not the, in, that's not the increase amount, 5% of 300. Yeah, that's right, that'd be the that'd total. That'd be the total, yeah. Okay. And then we can also probably fill in those numbers at the bottom for technology and deferred maintenance since we just approved those, right? We can absolutely do that and take off the stuff we crossed off, just looking for that final version. So. so we'll need to amend the motion. Does anybody have anything else to add to the comments first? Okay, so um, I, I amend the motion to approve the board priorities for 21, 20, for 2021, 2022, uh, with the changes discussed. Perfect, I got them. Okay. Second. Second by Mr. Skimowitz. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number 17, I call for a motion and a second to approve the new job specification for the classified management position of director, safety and security, effective immediately. Mr. Skimowitz? Loner. Uh, Mr. Loner? Is the motion in the second? Second. With Mr. Skimowitz. And any questions? Steve, can I refer to you? Uh, no, I don't have any questions. As, as I stated before, uh, Dr. McClay, I would uh, certainly like to provide input of where I think maybe uh, this could be flown to gain a little bit more exposure, especially on a nationwide level. Uh, if that search is, you know, to expand that far, so. That would be awesome. Can I get you in uh, connection with Mr. Arce so that we can get those resources? Thank you. And that falls on the director pay scale, the admin director? Yes. Okay. Excellent. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number 18, I call for a motion and a second to approve the new job spe specification for the cert certificated management position of coordinator of equity, access, and inclusion effective immediately. Move. Moved by Mr. Skimowitz. Second. Second by Mr. Schwartz. Is there any questions? This position may have discussed. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Number 19, I call for a motion and a second to approve resolution 2020-21-32. Move. Moved by Mr. Skibowitz. Second. Second by Mr. Loner. Can you explain that? Yes. Yeah, I know what it is. I, I can explain it. So this actually goes back, it was a change in our board policy. I think it's been about four years maybe is the estimate. So um, prior to that, when a board member was absent, um, 
they were just absent and they received their pay as normal. But, um, and then we um, reconsidered that because we were having a difficult time um, uh, with quorum. Only the same three people kept showing up and two people were consistently absent. So we put new um, language into our um, board policy, um, allowing for two absences to, for by board members um, to be paid um, by resolution. So if you're absent, the board has to come back at the following meeting or shortly after that um, to have a resolution to allow that individual to be paid. So after you get, you get two absences like that, on the third absence in, in the, um, it's in the calendar year, okay? At the third absence, you would not be paid for your absence, okay? Thank you. So um, being that Mr. Schwartz was um, unable to be at um, one of our meetings, um, this is to the resolution to um, pay him for that meeting. Just a quick question on that. So if uh, said bo board member is able to zoom in as a result of not being able to be here, is that qualify as attendance? Yes, that qualifies as attendance. Um, now, now that we're back in person, there's some, I, I'm not, I'm not, we're, I guess we're gonna have to check out the legalities of that. So typically um, uh, if a board member is absent and going to participate from another location, they need to notify um, Dr. McClay ahead of time because it has to be posted on the agenda where you will be participating from and then it has to be posted on your door like let's say you're in a hotel room someplace you have to actually post that on the door that there's a meeting in progress just like we have to post the meeting and you have to leave your door open for anyone who wants to come in and attend okay and then you can participate remotely so there is some criteria, but you would not be absent if you participated remotely, but it does take some prior arrangement. Okay. Did so, I get that uh, right, Dr. McClay? I would just like to add on my own behalf, um, I, was, I had a cold and I was asked to leave. I was not absent. I was uh, told that I could zoom in. I spoke to uh, Sue and she said I could zoom you in and I went home and I got a text and said, well, uh, it didn't work. We couldn't Zoom you in. So uh, I'm going to object that I was absent. I, I was not absent. I was here and uh, I am going to object to the resolution as being, um, I should have consulted an attorney, uh, as being, um, inaccurate and um, not only inaccurate, but um, <clears throat> invalid since I was not absent and I was told to leave, I was asked to leave because I was sick and um, I was told I could zoom in from home and that did not happen. So I, I object to this resolution. I, I don't think it's valid. Oh, okay, actually on this one, you actually won't vote on it, but this is a perfect time to perhaps propose to the board because the situation has changed, our dynamic has changed. Would the board be interested in removing this out of our protocols, um, especially during a time when if someone is sick, we certainly don't want them feeling that they have to be here. Well, I think the ability to zoom in, like if you just leave a meeting and and it's just hard to, you don't necessarily have that advantage of being able to prearrange something. And we do have COVID protocols right now that you cannot have certain health conditions going on and be in one of our facilities, whether it's a classroom or a district office or whatever, you just, that that is our protocol. We all have to do that check-in and you um, don't, you just, we're not allowed in, a, in somewhere if we have any kind of symptoms, whether it's a cold or uh, you know something, I don't know. It, it, it just asks you, do you have any new symptoms? So I'm not sure, I mean, I guess my perspective on it would be that um, no, none of us had a situation where we were absent more than two times. I think if you look at the number of meetings we have, it's less than 20 a year. 
And so if you're absent twice, you're only here for 90% of the meetings. Um, it was not an issue for any anyone that exceeded to. So I think if we got to the end of the year and we exceeded to and we wanted to consider should we make an exception because of what happened during COVID times or something like that, we could. The other option is, is that we can bring the board policy back to look at and have conversation and, and make a decision as a board, did we want to reevaluate that language that was put in there um, that we felt like we, we needed because of the, um, you know, we were, we were very often with only three people here and had one of those individuals had their own personal emergency or, you know, death in the family or whatever it is, then we don't have a quorum and the meeting has to be canceled. So that was the reason that we, um, no, I we, we that. did it, and, yeah. Uh, I looked through the governor's handbook and I cannot find what you're talking it's about. It's in board policy. You'd have to go to um, our policy manual. It, it, and, it's, and it's happened, Mr. Schwartz, too. It's happened in the, in the past. I, I've been ill, so I've missed the meeting, but I'm, I, I do apologize because we weren't able to Zoom you in due to technical difficulties, so I, I agree with you. That's why I brought it up. Do we want to re bring it back um, to our policy and perhaps remove this st the, stipula the policy that's in there regarding this? Sure, let's remove it. Well, we have to bring the policy back as an action Let's bring item. the policy back and let's remove it. And if someone's sick, let's not show up. Yeah, I, I agree that that's or, not. Or do, I mean, the other option is to just suspend it during COVID until we have a, you know. Exactly. So, so we can bring it back and look at it and make a decision. So do we want to table this act? I, I don't know what we do because right now it, we have am I Am I clear in assuming that this policy was put in place for, because of, what would have normally been negligence on the part of a board member, right? I mean, that's why the policy's in I, place. I, I, I can't, I mean, I certainly wouldn't say that. It could be individuals who were ill and just, um, you know, okay. couldn't come in. I guess this, this particular resolution is so that Mr. Schwartz is not docked any pay exactly. for that right. last meeting. So right. that's on his behalf. I'm saying policy mm -hmm. that it's based off yes, of. Yes, right. so, Yeah. So we, I think we could still vote on this to make sure that he's paid because the policy is currently in existence yeah. and then we could re-examine where we go in the future. Would that be satisfactory? Sounds great. Okay. So we and will bring the board item that spells this out back to, we'll try to get it on for May 4th with some suggestions for suspension or elimination of the language. I, I would prefer personally that this be, this be discussed in closed session? It no. can't be. Okay, well then I'll, I'll, I'll take other actions, okay. I'll, I'll deal with it in my own way. As I said, I have, a, I have other options to deal with this. I, I feel it's a blemish on my personal reputation that it is couched in those terms. When I was asked to leave and I was told I could zoom in for the rest of the meeting. I think this whole resolution is unfair and it's insulting personally. And I take it personally. I, I'm so sorry you feel that way. That's why. Well, you know what? You could be sorry I feel that way, but that's how I feel. And that's what 90% of this meeting was about all night was how people feel about what's going on. And I feel insulted and I feel degraded by this motion. You could have easily said to me, oh, you got a cold, you're fine, keep your mask on. You don't have to leave. But that didn't happen. You made a decision and I followed it and I said, okay, I'll go home and Zoom. So I don't have any more to say. You guys can do what you want. Steve, can I just make a quick observation? Sure. Uh, I made a comment earlier about uh, leaders in the organization and setting an example. We were very clear uh, with not only district staff, but also teachers in the classrooms as well. And we communicated it to parents as well, that if you were sick, it was to be understood that you would not be attending either school or your job in that capacity. I think that at the time and considering the condition, situation that we've been in over the last 13 months, uh, asking you to leave was not only warranted, but it was absolutely necessary to send a clear signal as leadership 
that we need to set the example for the rest of this district. I'm not objecting to that part of it. I'm objecting to what happened afterwards when I was told go home and we'll zoom you in. That was not my choice. I would like to make a motion to table this item at this time so that we can reevaluate what we can do so that um, we can address this at a later time. Does, does that have an effect, um, Mrs. Nash, on payroll? Right, so we need approval to pay him if it, his, uh, he was recorded as absent. So this is just for compensation, this motion, it, or this item is just for compensation. So this doesn't affect Mr. Schwartz's record or a blemish? Well, currently yeah, it's showing right. as an absence. And okay. so our board but policy says times, that compensation right. is based on attendance of meetings. Give me, give me one okay. second. So this is nothing, so this is a board policy and it's just on making sure for that month you get paid. It doesn't say that you were absent three times. It just says for this one to make sure you get paid the full amount, we're all gonna agree that there's no issue in, in terms of any sort of compensation as a missed meeting. So it's, it, it, we're just to make sure we're clarifying. This, us voting on this tonight makes it so that Ms. Lash is able to not, you want us to do that, right? Okay. And then I would propose bringing it back to have it removed so that it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not, a, it doesn't come back as a reflection as you're suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's really, I mean, anybody could be absent whether, um, you know, I, I remember somebody being absent because their student had an event. Somebody was absent because they were on vacation. Somebody's absent because they're ill. It's just like teachers. You have so many sick days, right? That you can use. And so this is board bylaw 9250. Um, you can actually, um, when you're in um, assembly, you can see right up on the top where it says policies. So you can go to that tab and you can pull down all of our policies and you could, you could read that board policy. So being that it is board bylaw, I don't think we have a choice but to follow our bylaws and then if we decide to make changes, we go forth from that. And um, Mr. Schwartz, you would not vote on this. You would have to abstain because it affects your, um, you financially. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 4-0 with Mr. Schwartz abstaining. Mr. Arthi with the negotiations update. <clears throat> Thank you, President Broach. We uh, met with TVA for negotiations on Tuesday and Friday of last week. Uh, we discussed safety measures, including uh, Qualtrics, plexiglass, the cleaning, disinfecting process. Another topic of conversation was SB 95. Uh, the COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. Um, we also discussed potential models of both elementary and secondary levels that could implement the new physical distancing guidelines. We look forward to meeting with TVA on Thursday of this coming week. Uh, we also met with CSEA on Tuesday of last week for negotiations. We discussed similar topics. Uh, district looks forward to meeting with CSEA again this coming Thursday as well. That's it for my report, President Broach. Thank you. Uh, board comments, Mr. Lunner? I've, uh, no. Okay, Mr. Schwartz. Um, uh, express, uh, I guess, my sympathy to those teachers who were involved in that incident with the administrators where they um, were asked to testify and, and give evidence about what happened and they felt that the result of the person uh, getting a settlement rather than going through the process of being uh, uh, relieved of their job was uh, not the outcome that they wanted. And uh, it is difficult for teachers to be in that kind of situation. I understand it. And I also uh, feel really uh, bad for some of the parents who came here to talk about what has happened with their children. Um, I unfortunately, my kids are grown and out of it, but for these, for this mom who has five kids in the school system, as emotional as she was, I wish there was more we could do to help them to get them through these kinds of situations. And uh, it's been tough for everybody, but I know it's been tough for the parents and the kids and the teachers. And I just express my feelings that uh, we need to look out for everybody. Mr. 
Um, yeah, I just, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll fill some buckets. Uh, I got a chance on Friday of last week to go with Dr. McClay to a, a few elementary schools um, and, and do some touring, and it was great to get um, the principal's perspective, talk to a few teachers, see the kids in motion, um, but the filling the bucket, it's really cool to see everyone be so grateful and appreciative of your work and the cabinet's work and everyone's um, efforts. So it was kind of nice to um, experience that in person. I think my favorite part is the when the high school students come in and do their updates. So it was great to have that back. And uh, um, I also just wanted to congratulate the um, of the years, right? So all the of the years. Um, uh, in particular, I hear David Schlotz, Schlotman's name in my house like all the time because my wife's an LCAP counselor and she talked to him often. So it was really great to see him acknowledged and awarded. And then um, Lisa Brown, I just wanted to bring it back to the principal of, of the year. Um, she was in my mom's fifth grade class and I've known her since she was 10. So it was really, really full circle fantastic to see her um, awarded and acknowledged too. Um, so, and I, the last thing I'll say is I just hope that everything goes well on Thursday and everyone's able to, you know, move forward and feel good about being on the same team and, and finding a way through the end of this year. But like I said, be excited and enthusiastic for what's coming in the fall. Thank you. So I'm going to keep it brief. We have, I think I've had said a lot along the way um, in today's meeting that it's been quite full and a lot going on. I'm going to add on to what you said about um, David Schlotman that um, when it was CSBA's Legislative Action Week, um, one of the topics that they asked us to come prepared um, with some local information was about um, Wi-Fi connectivity and some of the issues there. And so um, um, Mrs. McClay um, put me in touch with him to have some conversation and just amazing the things that he has done to reach out to our students um, and the stories that he told me. I mean, you don't think about in Temecula that we have that issue, but um, the students that were missing in action that he went out and found um, and students out in the wine country with no connectivity, they don't have a phone signal. We had students who are using their parents' um, phones to connect to the internet until they run out of, um, data or and and then they can't afford it anymore and so they're unable to attend and being able to bring those kids in and get them hooked up and get them devices and and even the um the my fives that we had didn't work out there um so it's the wrong phone company um and just just the I, i'm not going to go into all those stories because being able to share those with our legislators and, and now seeing the action that they're taking, and I'm, I'm after hearing from all of the CSBA um, um, members who, who had that voice and shared their stories, I think that that was just very impactful, and, and I was very proud to, he to um, share some of the things that have been going on and, 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 and what we've been able to accomplish for our EL kids, and so kudos to him for that, and um, that's my only comments this evening, so. It was great to see our ASB kids back here, especially our seniors. It's their only time. They generally get, you know, all these months to come in and get to know us as a board, and we get to celebrate them as they um, are graduating. So I'm so glad that they got tonight to be their first and last. And appreciative for the gifts. As a former bear, I keep all the academic pens that I'm given, um, and I put them on my badge because I will always be a bear. Um, I went to the opening at LaVornia, so Lisa Brown, being the principal of the year, I agree, she was fantastic. The opening, her enthusiasm, uh, David Schlotman also, I had the opportunity to get to know him as a parent at Chaparral, and his enthusiasm is right there every single day. He never wavers, so I think that's pretty incredible. Um, I think that that's about all that I had tonight. Dr. McClay? I'll be brief, I know it's late. I just wanted to thank you we, we had a lot of really good work done tonight when you really think about it. Um, a, a whole bunch of dense topics in the action items. Uh, increasing sub pay has been something we've wanted to do for years. 
So that's a great accomplishment. The Home Instead program with Mrs. McKay and getting those job descriptions done, we're really, really excited about that. Equity coordinator, super excited about that. Uh, Director of Safety and Security. Um, you committed dollars tonight to technology, to deferred maintenance. Those also we've wanted to do really since Mrs. Lash referenced 2007 when we cut them. So that's a cause for celebration. We've reiterated to our community and staff that we have full intentions of reopening 100% in the fall. That's something to be celebrated in addition to continuing to work to get even more between now and the end of the school year. So thank you, that was a lot. It was a long evening, but everybody persevered and we got some great stuff done. Great, future agenda items. Staff will present information on the following agenda items for the meeting on May 4th, 2021. A study session, at risk programs, absenteeism, suspension, expulsion data, restorative practices, and then also alternative education and new options for 2021-22. We have no reason to move back into closed session. The next regular open session business meeting of the Governing Board of Education is scheduled for May 4th, 2021 at 6 p.m. in the Administration Center Conference Facility Rooms A, B, and C. 31350 Rancho Vista Road, Temecula, California. The meeting is now adjourned at 9.24 p.m.